order the Queen Anne's County Planning Commission, Thursday, June the 9th, 2022, and we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Public comment. We have anything? Uh, we have people for text amendments later, and we also have people for the site plan later. But I don't know if anyone in the room is here to make general public comment. Yeah, any any general public comments? Looks like none. So let's go on. Meeting minutes review. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Updates, legislation, and legal matters. Good morning. Um, as you all may already know, the comp plan was adopted on May 24th. Um, also, the Kent Naris Community Plan. Um, so we want to thank you all, you know, for your help and your guidance and time, you know, that you have put into that project. So it was a, you know, a great time to see that plan get signed, and um, you all deserve a big thank you for that. So thank you. Um, also, want to let you know that the text amendment, the citizen-sponsored text amendment from last year, 2104. Um, you may recall this is to allow solar outside of the USSA district, the one that was um, yeah, 2104, sorry. The commissioners had a public hearing on May 24th for that text amendment. You do have a text amendment, you have the citizen-sponsored text amendments for this year in front of you um, this morning, but 2206, um, that amendment also, which was submitted this year, um, does impact the solar um, regulations as the 2104 does. So we're going to wait until the decision is made by the county commissioners for 2104 before sending 2206 in front of you so that you have that decision has been, been made. So you have a, it's not confusing in any way. So um, you will probably be seeing that next month, um, hopefully. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Rob Tracy. I'm a senior planner on the Long Range team. Um, I'm here today to um, ask for your acceptance of the annual report. The annual report is required um, by state legislation. Each year, counties are required to report to uh, the Maryland Department of Planning um, on an annual basis regarding uh, development, permitting planning activities that occur in the county. Um, so within your packet, um, I've included the report for you, um, and I ask for a motion um, for you to accept the report so that I may send it off to the Maryland Department of Planning. Okay. Do we have a motion? Hmm. I move that we accept the annual report. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> so moved. Thank you. Miscellaneous staff items, are we there? We are there, and I'm Amy Mordock, Planning Director. And I really, I don't have a report this month. We have a lot of business to get to, but I wanted to echo um, Stephanie's appreciation and personally thank the whole board for all of your hard work and guidance. I feel that the plans that we have enacted are very good, solid plans, are very uh, proactive in addressing some of our big challenges. And again, I think that we had a great base to start from and that we've streamlined those plans and have made them a lot more user-friendly. Um, and we have really good guidance on how to move forward with our zoning ordinance and zoning map updates. Um, so again, you had some real obstacles in front of you and I uh, respect very much uh, all of the hard work and all of the contemplation that you put into that review, especially on the tough items to um, get us to where we have some really good guidance. And I want to especially thank Chairman Dobson, who really had to um, guide the team and do a lot of extra homework on um, some of those uh, more complicated issues. And so. we couldn't have done it without the staff. <laughs> 
Yes, and also thank you to the whole staff and the yeah. technical committee. Yeah, we may be the public us. faces of this process, but I think the heavy lifting goes on in your office. And you were short-staffed for much of that as well. So thank you, thank you both you and Stephanie. Right. And the Wallace and Montgomery. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Extension request, Chester Storage. Good morning. We thought we were going to be able to pull this this morning. Excuse me? We thought we were going to be able to pull this from the agenda. Yeah, we hope so, but uh, evidently <laughs> the work wasn't substantial enough at, that, at this point. I'm Jack Leone, owner of Chester Storage. Mary Griffin, Plane Engineering. Right. Um, Mr. Leone uh, obtained uh, site plan approval for a major site plan amendment um, in November of 2019. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, uh, in the May of 19, he had obtained a Board of Appeals conditional use approval for an expansion of his existing self-storage facility. What was approved by you all was a site plan for an approximately 11,000 square foot uh, climate controlled interior access storage building adjacent to his existing storage facility. Um, because of a lot of factors related to COVID pandemic, uh, logistics, price increases, um, availability of contractors, material shortages, Mr. Leone has not been able to move forward, uh, was not able to move forward effectively over the last couple of years. But um, in April, he did obtain, uh, April and May, obtained a grading permit, um, has had a pre-construction meeting, and um, has actually had his contractor there to install the construction entrance, uh, remove the existing fence, and put up the silt fence. And as soon as his contractor can, he will commence grading and uh, site work. Um, so the way the, the policy works, you need to commence construction within two years. And we're, we're a little beyond that, um, but we are confident that over the next three months that the site work and grading will commence. Okay. We have discussion. We have a motion. Madam Chair, I'll make a motion that we grant the applicant Chester Storage LLC a major site plan 19-08-0031, uh, their first extension for 90 days from today. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Concept plan, Penn Island Crossing, reliable real estate services. You want us up there Bob now, Gunter. Madam Chair? Yeah, you, you I need Bob. Okay. Ready? Stephanie's back here. I'm blind. I can't help it. <laughs> I'll put mine up for you. The TV's too far. The computer's too close. Like, I, I can't see any of you, so it's okay. Um, so. Ready for me? All right, I'm Rob Gunter, a development review planner with Queen Anne's County. So as you mentioned, we are here for Ken Island Crossing today. Uh, the applicant is proposing to construct a commercial development that's going to approximately be 142,830 square feet in total. Um, that would include four restaurants, um, office and retail space, a grocery store, and an independent living facility. And today they are requesting a parking reduction, confirmation of growth allocation consistency that was granted in 2005, and concept plan approval. Um, this presentation from the staff's point of view will be a touch different for you guys halfway through once we get to the critical area. I'll turn it over to our expert, Stephanie. Okay. Um, so her and I will swap seats real quick. But So here we are with the general location. You can see it's located in Chester, which is on Ken Island. Um, more specifically, um, there are two parcels, tax map 57, parcel 8, and parcel 374. Um, the project will require an administrative um, subdivision to combine uh, both those parcels. Um, in the end, they would total just over 14 and a half acres. 
This project is north of Route 50 and adjacent to the Ken Island Volunteer Fire Department and Anne Arundel Medical Center buildings. <clears throat> um, currently, you can see there are some existing structures. They are, oops, wrong button. Um, all of they're proposed to be removed. The property is zoned town center. It lies within the Chester Stevensville growth area and it's within the county's enterprise zone. So here's a, a clip of the concept plan. In green outline are the proposed buildings. They're numbered one through seven. Buildings one and two on the top left are standalone restaurants. Building three would be a fast food restaurant. Building four is mixed commercial. It would include another fast food, casual type restaurant, um, some office, perhaps some retail space. Building five would be retail. Building six would be the grocery. And building seven would be the independent living facility. Conceptually at this time, um, this development does meet the town center um, zoning district requirements. It would be served by public sewer and water. Storm water would be on site. Um, they are requesting or proposing 557 parking spaces, and that's uh, where the reduction comes in. They're, they're asking for a reduction of 12 spaces from the required 569. Um, walking you through this, um, as I mentioned, the, the green are the buildings. The teal dashed areas are public areas, which would have tables, umbrellas, benches, trash cans, um, bike racks and things of that sort. The solid brown or orange lines there is the internal uh, pedestrian um, walkways with crosswalks and nuts to, to lead everybody through the site. On the exterior of the site is the brown dashed line, which would be a perimeter sidewalk with connections on the north side to the Cross Island Trail shown there in black. <clears throat> the floor area on the bottom left that's a site statistics table from the concept plan. Floor area total <coughs> shown is 142,830. That breaks down each individual use below that. The town center district does have a 65,000 square foot gross floor area limitation on most uses. Um, there are a limited selection of exceptions. Uh, one of those exceptions is for non-profit and for-profit institutional uses which is why the independent living facility could be proposed at its size. The remaining uses on that site would total uh, 54,750 square feet, which would be below the 65,000 square foot limitation. So what we've done here is taken that clip of the site plan and overlaid it on the aerial image and then added in the environmental features that are located on the site. So that pink line on the left with the arrows pointing to the right is the critical area line. Uh, everything to the east side is in the critical area with the designation of IDA. That's the area that received the growth allocation that you'll hear more about shortly. The blue teal line is the 300 foot shore buffer. There will be no disturbance within this area. On the bottom right, you'll see, uh, hopefully you'll see um, a Green and olive green dashed line and a solid line that is the non tidal wetland and wetland buffer. There is no disturbance proposed in the wetland. There's potential for a touch of uh, disturbance to the buffer on the little corner of the um, parking area there. The blue solid line and blue dash line are the stream and stream buffer that exist on site. No disturbance within those areas either. And also down there in the right, um, that little, that hatched area, um, I don't, let's see if we can get the cursor up, down here is a forested area. There will be no proposed um, disturbance in that area either. The applicant is proposing to place that into long-term protection. There are some trees, as I mentioned, in the middle here around the existing structures that will be removed. And there's a strip up here along Piney Creek. There. Uh, approval in June 9th, 2005. Um, and those conditions, the um, current proposal is going to meet that by. It's not a strip commercial development. Um, the architecture of lot one and lot two are similar. Um, additional vegetation has been provided 
along the roseways. Um, there is a green space also provided um, in the center part of the development. Um, there's no buildings within the 300 foot buffer, which Rob already mentioned, and then the, the parking spaces have been reduced and then they're asking for the reduction. Um, at the critical area commission uh, level, it was approved September 7th, 2005. Um, there is additional pollutant reduction being provided. Um, that's a requirement within the IDA, whether it's growth allocation or not, but they are providing additional as to more than what they're required to, to do. Um, and then there's no disturbance in the non-tidal wetlands. Uh, for the county commissioners, that was granted on December 6, 2005, um, and this is where a lot of the um, conditions actually come from. Um, there's no disturbance within the 300-foot buffer, and you'll see some of these conditions kind of overlap, um, but they are, some of them are the same, some of them aren't. Um, there's 408 trees being provided. They were asked to provide additional landscaping. Um, there's no disturbance, I said, in the non-tidal wetland, and then they are to provide an agreement with the Kentland Volunteer Fire Department as to how they're going to um, basically compensate for the development that's being done. And I think in your packets it kind of outlines that agreement a little more, and I'm sure the applicant can speak to it a little bit more. Um, the gas station is no longer being proposed. There is a gas station in the proposal. Um, the applicant is going to continue to work with DPW on their stormwater requirement. They're asked to do additional stormwater. Um, so as the process kind of moves along, um, they're going to work with DPW to figure out how exactly or what exactly they're going to do for it to be additional. Um, the 2005 renderings are similar to the existing renderings. They've got pitched roofs, and I'll show you the renderings from 2005 once we, we get to that. Um, they are connecting to the Cross Island Trail, as Rob showed you. Um, they are reducing the impervious surfaces, um, and the landscape area is being increased along with the reduction of the parking. Um, they're also required to design and then um, provide financial contributions to the county for a let's see, site plan for improve improvements at Maryland 18 and 522, and also additional northbound lane through Maryland 18 to Castle Marina Road, and then a traffic signal at Maryland 18, which is Main Street, and then Piney Creek Road. So if you want me to bring up a map, we can kind of look at that of those conditions if you, if you need it. Um, and then they're also required to provide a $50,000 um, park, basically contribution to parks and recs. So um, the, that's part of the, all the requirements that they're required to do with their growth allocation. So this is kind of an overlap of the 2005 proposal and then the one from today. So you'll see the, the 2002 proposal is in green, and then the 2005 um, is in red. And I'll, we'll go through what was proposed in 2005. So in 2005, the, the larger um, red area to the east, that was to be a grocery store. Um, and then there was also retail and restaurant space also <coughs> provided as it is today. Um, and there was also a gas station to be provided, um, and, but they're no longer um, doing that. That was removed. Um, Totally. Um, and then you can see there how there, um, you know, there are in the similar locations if you were to look to see how they're compared and in the locations. Um, but the next slide really shows you the change as the square footage or um, what exactly the changes are. So there is an increased floor area between 2005 and now, but that reduction in floor area is associated with the commercial component. Um, but then there is an increase overall due to the independent living. Um, like I've already mentioned, there is a, a reduction in the impervious surface. There is an increase in landscaping area. Uh, they are doing a parking reduction um, of less 88 <coughs> spaces, less than the original in 2005. They removed the gas station. Uh, the independent living facility has been added, and, and then this, the size of the grocery store in itself has been re reduced about 41,000 square feet. Um, and then the grocery store basically is, the 2005 grocery store is the location of the independent living facility now. Um, and I think it's important to note that although the, there is still a grocery component, um, that independent living facility might offer a little less um, congestion because there's going to be people <coughs> going there and staying for a longer period of time as they would be going to a gas station which has been removed <coughs> and the, um, the grocery store. Um, so there are still retail, restaurant, um, and also the trail connections being proposed as they were in 2005. So here are the renderings 
from 2005. Um, you know, they're still offering kind of the same kind of neutral, neutral colors, reds, brown, tan. Um, you got your varying roof pitches across the whole entire proposal. Um, the use of bricks and materials that are, you know, you're not using the same material across the entire proposal. It's varying. Um, and then Rob has kind of already showed you the architectural designs for the 2020-2022 proposal. Um, but the one thing I also wanted to point out, um, their consistency with what would be a growth allocation proposal, um, the consistency with the comp plan, um, the reserving sewer, the comp plan designates to reserve sewer for commercial and institutional uses. The uses on this project, pro this proposal are um, institutional and commercial. Um, they're directing, by putting this obviously in this location, we're directing growth to the growth area, which is obviously the intent in the comp plan. Um, the comp plan also speaks a little bit to the ages um, of the growth areas, so that's kind of a couple more bullet points down, but um, the property is designated commercial um, in the, the growth area, and then it does discourage the strip-style strip commercial development. Uh, the proposal is consistent with the, comp with the critical area program, um, and like I mentioned before, they have to pro provide that economic benefit with the growth allocation application. Um, and all that plethora of conditions that were placed on this, uh, providing you know, a compensation to the Kent Island Volunteer Fire Department, um, connection to the Cross Island Trail, the road improvements, the traffic light, those are all economic benefits for the community. Um, and then they are, um, obviously I've said they're not impacting, and Rob kind of already said this too, they're not impacting the non-tidal wetlands or the 300 foot shore buffer. Um, so they are minimizing those impacts to habitat protection areas and then they're optimizing their water quality benefits by providing additional water quality treatment than what they're required to do per critical area requirements. That is all. Is there a certain slide you want me to put up that would be easiest to look at when discussing this project, you think? <clears throat> One of the easy. Well, they seem to have made everything better. Um, is there something that you want to see? At this point in time, no, okay. Mm -mm. Okay. I'll just go back to the... That's probably the best. Awesome. Okay. Great. Mr. Good, Stevens. Good morning. Good morning, Planning Commissioners. Joseph Stevens, um, on behalf of Reliable, I have John Dixon here to my right, who is the principal, Tom Davis to my left, who you all know as the as the project engineer, and we also have the architects present, one via Zoom and one sitting right behind me, if you have questions for them. Um, the staff did an extremely thorough job on this. Uh, the staff report was detailed and included uh, uh, that Stephanie and had mentioned, uh, Rob, but a whole bunch of background information, so I'm sure you read it, you always do, um, and so I'm not going to belabor any of that. I was involved in 2003, 4, and 5 on this project. It was the giant shopping center and in fact after it received growth allocation from the commissioners that consisted of Mr. Ransom, Mr. Koval and you know the group that was very um, um, cautious on, on growth but they gave this growth allocation because they saw it as in the middle of the growth area an important um, commercial project um, and, um, and it moved forward. We had it as scheduled for the Planning Commission for final site plan. All the engineering done, uh, we're ready to walk in, and then Giant walked away. Their whole business model changed, um, and they, the anchor left, and the developer just said, I'm not going any further unless we have an anchor, and it stopped, and that's, where, that's how it stopped. It received sewer allocation for the whole project, and, but then that was refunded and, um, and didn't move forward. A uh, couple of points that I, that I just want to make, and then Tom's going to just talk about the stormwater briefly, and then any questions you have for John about the end user, you might have questions about the, um, um, uh, the living facility. Uh, but just a, a few points is that the gas station was very contentious back in the mid 2000s, 2005, 6, when we had it approved. And you can see there's like four conditions about monitoring the, uh, the tanks and things of that nature. Um, and, uh, and so that's just been removed from the project altogether, which we think is a real positive um, for a few reasons. One is, is you know, there's 
been a lot more gas stations developed in this day and age now since back then, and then we don't have the environmental concerns either. Uh, there's the, 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 while there's an increase in floor area, um, it's all due to the living facility, which is going to generate less traffic um, than what the straight retail did. Now, we will have to do a completely new traffic study before we can submit for site plan approval. So that will be done, but this was the first step as, as planning staff had outlined for you. Um, nonetheless, the developer is still committed and, and, and has agreed to doing all of the traffic improvements that the original traffic study warranted. So that's what, that's what Stephanie had listed for you, all those improvements. Um, uh, less lot coverage, more landscape surface area, and, uh, and you know, right adjacent to the Cross Island Trail and communities like Gibson's Grand Four Seasons that will be able to walk there, take their bikes there. We think it's a great project. Um, and now I'm just going to turn it over to Tom to give you some highlights on how stormwater has changed from what was approved back originally. Thank you. Tom Davis with DMS and Associates. Um, at the time, the original concept and site plan that Joe just referred to were being done. The state of Maryland was just beginning their uh, program related to, it's called environmental site design to the maximum extent practical. Queen Anne's County was ahead of the game and required the original developer to address water quality by implementation of bioretention systems, submerged gravel wetlands, and so on and so forth. However, the, the state of Maryland adopted their uh, new stormwater requirements in 2010 after that development had kind of ceased to go through the process. So we've gone back and uh, redone calculations to make sure that this site can meet the ESD to the MEP uh, requirements, which include similar uh, systems that were proposed on the original project, uh, but enhanced with uh, you know, more detailed design. So that's really the big change from the 2005 concept to, to current. So we've uh, worked with uh, the staff, uh, both Department of Public Works and Planning and Zoning to make sure that we are meeting those requirements. And then of course, as we move forward with the development review process, we will address in detail those systems design. So, John, do you want to give a brief? Maybe tool? someone could talk about uh, why the parking should be reduced. You've okay. Got a mix so, of uses. Yep. You've got the so there's a couple here. things. Um, the, the, there's a big mix of uses in here, and if you look at the central area where buildings, I think it's buildings uh, four, <coughs> five, and six are. Those are the uh, retail uh, center areas, and it is our opinion that there will be some shared parking uses. So if I go into the food store, I might stop over to one of the other retails. In addition, our county requires one space per 50 square foot on a um, fast food use. And today, I think more people are using the drive-through uh, activity more so than the uh, you know stop and go into the store. So there was two or three things that. Uh, kind of led us to believe that there should be some reduction in parking of 12 spaces uh, you know, to accommodate and recognize that there's some shared parking issues here in the center due to the, the varying uses. May we assume that the independent living use will generate? Well, the independent, the independent living use definitely reduces uh, traffic, uh, you know, as compared to the food store. Uh, and, and the gas station that were proposed originally in the project. I think we also submitted, the architects submitted a traffic, a, a um, parking estimate for the uh, independent living facility yeah. showing that it was based on other ones they've done and submitted that to staff which concurred would have a lesser um, yeah. a traffic, uh, not traffic, a lesser parking. Uh, parking requirement and that was the basis, a strong basis for why we're asking for a 12 space reduction. The other thing too is, is, is that if you look at the original conditions, the county commissioners wanted us to go back and look at ways to reduce lot coverage and impervious coverage. So that was part of the impetus to do this yes. at this point as well. From an ownership and a management perspective, uh, we're also looking at this site. And one of the reasons why we were intrigued by this site is that there's a lot of demand that's going to be within walking distance of this site. And they're not necessarily everyone going to be driving their car to get here. With two access points connections to the Cross Island Trail, people coming to get a sandwich or whatever while they're out uh, walking on the trail, Everyone that can walk from Gibson's Grant, that can walk from Four Seasons, that can walk from the communities down uh, Castle Marina Road, uh, that's, that, that creates a lesser demand for parking on the project and allowed us to add more green area and forest retention area and planting area on the site. So, 
We have the architect here if you have questions for them. Otherwise, we can step back and we'll be here for questions if you have any throughout the remainder of your deliberation, however you'd like to handle it. Um, okay, before we ask for public comment, you want, you have any questions here with the commissioners? I would offer that staff from DPW is here too, so should you have questions for them. Okay. Great, thank you, we'll be right there. Okay, any public comment on this project? Do we have a list? So our email servers were very busy uh, this week. We had over 80, it looks like, names, and we were very up to date. We got the list to you, and I checked it right before I came up here, and it's completely up to date. Uh, all these letters were As opposed. As of 5.30 this morning. Yeah, and I, I double check now, and it's the same list. No one's okay. added since then. Okay. So we were going to read one letter of it, and this is the same letter that everyone submitted with small uh, alterations to it, Except but you have all those. about six of them. What's that? About six of them sent their own letter. Yes, okay. but it said basically the same thing. Yes. So dear Planning Commission, I would like to enter in a public record that I, and then they answered their name, am against the combining of parcels for the Kent Island Crossing concept plan that will be decided upon at the Planning Commission meeting this Thursday, June 9th. I'm a Queens County citizen and lifelong resident of Kent Island and do not feel this project is good for the area. Please do not ruin Kent Island more than it already has been. This project will greatly affect an already strained infrastructure and increased traffic in the most congested area of Kent Island. While I agree that most would welcome another grocery store option or near Kent Island, this is not the right location for it. Traffic in this area becomes a standstill weekly during the summer, but is busy year round. The additional residents at Four Seasons will add to the once will add to this once completed. So the true impact of what is coming is yet to be seen and cannot fully be evaluated at this point. We are not the Western Shore. We should strive to set ourselves apart and be proud of our quickly fading rural heritage, our natural landscape, and down home charm. People move here to get away from that typical cityscape and commotion of places like Bethesda, Columbia, Annapolis, and the town center shopping malls. Let's not turn Kent Island and Queen Anne's County into what everyone is running away from. In conclusion, after your careful consideration of the character and the traffic changing impact that this project will have on the already suffering road system of Kent Island, we request that you reject the combining of parcels for the Kent Island Crossing concept plan. The Kent Island community appreciates your thoughtful consideration. And that's all for those. Okay. All right, for public comment, uh, David Azar. That was for tax amendment later. Uh oh. That was not on this project. Okay. All right, on the concept plan, Helen Bennett. <clears throat> Good morning. Thank you for letting me speak. I agree with Wait, all. You have to. Helen. Your name and where you. Helen from. Bennett. I live on Kent Island. Um, and I would. I'm obviously opposed to this project. Um, I paid somebody to take my shift today. Um, as most of you know, I also sit on a, a, a board in town, which keeps me very busy. But the people on Kent Island don't feel like they're being heard. Now, it was ironic when we talked about the growth allocation was given in 2005, because he said that they pulled the gas station off. Now, I sat in those stack meetings when they tried to do the Harris Teeter a couple of years ago and they had the gas station in there. And we had the same number of gas stations in, in 2018 or 19, whenever that was proposed, 13, as we do now. But it's ironic that he said the gas station was removed because, quote, a lot more gas stations have been added since then in 2005. But you know what else has been added since 2005? We have added the Anne Arundel Medical Center, the 60-unit luxury um, apartments on Postal Road, Ellendale, the Barnstable Project, Target, the Beach Club, Ken Island Sewer, and the five-foot lots up there. A lot has been added. So maybe this entire project needs to be pulled because since 2005, when that growth allocation was given, a lot has happened. And you can't possibly care about the people on Ken Island, which is the highest density of people, um, and still keep adding things like this. Now, you say you're going to increase a little bit of, um, you're going to try to ease the traffic right in front of there. And I would encourage you to do a, um, a more objective traffic study. The State Highway Administration has rated the worst intersection in town, which is right there on 18 and Dominion, a B. 
a B. When you look at it, they average it. So it's like F, 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 F for any time that matters. And then you get an A or a B rating at 2 o'clock in the morning on a Wednesday. And then they average it and say, oh, you can take more traffic at this intersection. And it just can't. And now when you, add, when you help the little people right there, do you not think that affects those of us in our businesses? I have a business on Main Street. It's impossible to turn left as it is. It's impossible to turn left out of um, the next, the Rite Aid, the little kids thing across from Rite Aid that um, uh, they put in that daycare or whatever. It is so hard for businesses. Postal Road is backed up, and now with those 60 units that you all approved with, um, and it needed variances, so it wasn't an okay project until you gave them consideration. I'm just saying vote no, because the people of Kent Island should matter to you. And this project does not help us. I also would like additional shopping. This is not the right project, at the right place, at the right time. Thank you. John. Okay. Joshua Willis. I don't, I don't have anyone else's name on here for this. <coughs> and what is your name? Joyce Stewart. Joyce, spell your last name. And it's on the concept plan. Okay. Get all in closing. Okay, Joshua. Hi. So I'm Joshua Willis. I'm a lifelong resident of Kent Island and Queen Anne's County. Um, professional musician and writer, local business owner, and president of Historic Kent Island Nonprofit. So I'm not only speaking on for my behalf today, but on the project's behalf and the organization's behalf. Um, which we are 100% against this project, cannot cross it, for various reasons. <clears throat> Although its commercial aspect and proposal fall within the guidelines of the zoning, the senior independent living, in our opinion, should not be classified as commercial. Um, there's the people that will live there, use the bathroom, and take showers, just like the rest of us living in the rest of the residential areas on Cat Island. So they will be using more sewer than any other commercial aspect within this plan. Um, we have an obvious sewer issue on Kent Island as it is, and the commissioners did set aside enough sewer for commercial use. So speaking of a grocery store in the retail space, that fits that bill. It's, it feels a little bit weird to fit in the bit largest facility in this project into this project. And at 88,000 square feet, it is the biggest building, the facility for the senior living. So that seems to be the main focus, and that seems to fall within residential if you're going to have people living there full time. No one will be living in this other commercial space full time, the grocery store and the rest of the retail space. So the sewer committed for commercial use should be for commercial use. Um, also, the traffic around this area, if you live on Kent Island or anywhere in the area, you know it's hard in the summertime especially, it comes to a complete standstill. Most of us, I personally use a bike to get around. I don't even get on the roads. We have a boat, we have a bike. We don't get near anything on 50. We don't use the main road of 18 because it comes to a standstill. And putting any more congestion in this area is almost, it's not only dangerous, but almost irresponsible. Four seasons isn't even 20% done, maybe, maybe around 20% done. So to ignore what that impact will have once it's fully completed is also irresponsible. And there's no way to really tell how these roads are going to uh, be used and how many people are going to be on these roads daily until that project's complete. So approving this project before that project's complete and being able to take a true study seems like the wrong way to do it. Um, with that said, a traffic study, like Helen said, they are, to, they are average, and there's nobody on the road overnight. So the, the, the best time to really do it is in the summertime and on the weekends to really see the impact. Because regardless of if the roads are open during the week and during commuting hours, if you have an emergency on a weekend during this time, nobody's going anywhere. You're not going to be able to save any lives. The, the people of Kent Island should be your true traffic study. And we say it every day. You can see it on social media. And speaking of social media, our post that went up on Monday to speak out on this project it reached over 6,000 people and it had over 
700 comments and 260 shares, and that was organically. There was no money put behind that. I'm okay, just, thank that you. Was it. Time's up. Let's just go. so you know, the people are all against this. All right, next. Joyce Jewett, Floyd. Hi, how are you? Um, my question to the developers. Oh, where are you from? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm from Kent Island. I live in Baybridge Cove, which is a new development that's just been finished, built out off of Route 8. Um, and I'd like to ask a couple questions to developers. Do any of you live here on the island? One member of our group does. Okay. Do you? Uh, so very good. I, as I said, I live in the 55 plus community. Not any of us ride our bikes or walk any place. There's 272 homes in my community, and all of us drive wherever we go. Um, I, on Saturday, made the mistake of having to go to the grocery store because I had unexpected guests. And it took me from Safeway to my house on Route 8 an hour to get home, which should be less than a 15-minute drive. The roadways will not accommodate what they're proposing here. And to say that people living in their, their um, existed living is not going to be driving is a total mistake. You can go to the Cape Covanian development. Those people don't walk any place. They all drive their cars. Um, I think that a meeting or something needs to be done with the developers in the various communities here to find out how it's going to impact our lives. And quite honestly, I've lived over here for almost 30 years. and. The development over here is horrendous. I mean, we're beginning to look like um, Columbia, Maryland. And that is not what I moved over here for. Um, and I don't see any benefit, quite honestly, to Kent Island of this development. So thank you for letting me speak out today. OK, thank you. Any other comments? <clears throat> OK, now it's up to us to talk. I have a question either for staff or Mr. Stevens. I'll start with staff just because. Um, can you speak to the point that was brought up about sewer allocations for commercial versus residential and how this assisted senior living, whatever the euphemism we're using for, is designated and how that impacts the conversations that this board has had with allocation and, and capacity, quite honestly, at our wastewater treatment plants? I'll ask for Trey to come up and further explain my answer, but um, the independent living facility is considered an institutional use, so it's not, people live there, yes, but by use and for sewer capacity issues, it is institutional, so it is um, counted differently. Um, beyond that, we're going to punt to but the definition yeah I'm Trey Porter with DBW and I can confirm that that is the case um, we recognize that there's a residential component to it but when it comes to the zoning it is institutional and that that number right that X whatever that generation will be or that load that will be delivered to the wastewater treatment plant that has already been reserved it's been reserved based on square footage of an of a uh, institutional facility so the conversations that we have had on this topic of sewer capacity that this number has already been included in that mr. Lee you're by reserve do you mean allocated officially Correct. they do not have allocation to no allocation knowledge. so they're asking for additional we'll go to the county commissioners after this and request it so they're the ones that All right sorry for my sloppy language no you're fine you're fine <laughs> I just wanted to clarify so, uh, what uh, capacity was allocated back in 2005, but when the deal with Giant fell apart, that was returned. Uh, returned. Uh, it was. It, they didn't pay for it, and therefore it was. Uh, it went back into the back into the system. Okay. Uh, the, also, uh, think about so-called commercial apartments, uh, second floor, third floor, above retail. Uh, as you know, they're getting sewer allocation regularly because it's not a quote no, residential exactly. use on the same premise because they're not individually <coughs> owned they're leased or rented no, so it's a commercial no, enterprise so they're seen differently by not to put a target on Trey's head but they're seen differently by DPW as I know I'm right. because of the definition of, even though they're residential they're combined this use they are categorized let's say 
as a different sewage allocation. Yes, that's a fair description. Okay. okay. Thank you for clarifying. One of the a comment I would like to make, um, the way I see it, if you put that grocery store in there, you're going to relieve a lot of Ken Island of the local traffic because there is no access for anyone that lives on the north side of the island to get groceries at any time. And I know because that's where I live. Um, it, it's very difficult on weekends, as we all know, no matter where you are on the island. But I don't know that this is such a bad thing for, for a grocery store to go in on the, on the uh, north side of the island. Because I see where, where Ms. Bennett's store is. She won't have all those people going to Safeway on, on the weekends, and she won't have all those people trasping over there for the, the Chick-fil-A or the, or, the, or the McDonald's because there's going to be something on the north side that we don't have. I'm just putting it out there for a, a, another thought. So, any other questions from the commissioners? Well, just one. <clears throat> I mean, my understanding is this is really the first step that you guys are taking in this process. This is the concept plan. This is not approval to build out, do anything else. This is just how does it look at this point? Uh, you know, I, I heard the young man talk about traffic. Traffic study's not done yet. Traffic study's going to get done. Sewer allocation, sewer allocation is not done yet. So this is the first step. That's all it is. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Any further questions or? Who goes into a 22,000 square foot grocery store? I hope it's not We can't Aldi. hear you. Who goes into a 22,000 square foot grocery store? I hope it's not Aldi. It's a suit. It, it will be a smaller format grocery store. I, we don't have a user yet. Okay. We're negotiating with a few. But the grocery business has drastically changed from 2005 to now. Um, the advent of Amazon delivery and grocery deliveries have really changed the scope of grocery stores looking at new locations. And this is a smaller format specialty retailer grocer that will have the things you need, but is not necessarily going to have a complete aisle of toilet paper and, 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 and paper towels. They'll have them, but it's not going to be 60,000 square feet of massive store. It's, it's, it's going, and they'll have specialty items, some probably a significant prepared food area for, you know, convenience of folks, you know, dinner on the way home. Um, and work in conjunction with the other tenants within the center. But that, that's not Aldi then. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Might be. Might be. I'm not that. saying it's not going to be, but that's not. We, 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 we don't have a deal with anyone at this point in time. Okay. Any questions? Are we, can I get a, um, First, I guess well, we have I'm to do is the parking we reduction. Could, uh, we heard some talk about averaging on uh, averaging uh, uh, traffic through intersections uh, at, at peak times and at two o'clock in the morning. It, it, is that really how? That's not how it works. I, I didn't think so. Maybe we could somebody, Tom or Trey, can you clear that up? Good point. I can. We um, for for traffic analysis, generally speaking, we <clears throat> excuse me, we do not look at a worst case scenario. So we uh, the, any traffic design is not going to take your um, you know five o'clock on a Friday or consider beach traffic or something like that. Um, traffic analysis doesn't work that way. We do take an average, but we certainly if a if a intersection, a problem intersection like Dominion and Main Street. Um, that area is, is a known problem, and it is not recognized as a B intersection. We recognize that that is the worst intersection in the county. Uh, we also have limitations on that particular intersection because of right-of-way um, and commercial development on all four corners. 
Um, but that's not generally how it works. That intersection is a failing intersection and um, both the state and the county recognize that. Um, but in generally speaking, when it comes to traffic design, we, uh, we, we, look at a com we look at traffic studies that occur in the, in the winter, on the weekends, the weekdays, and we do not average it, um, but we, we definitely do not design based on the worst 20% of all traffic going through at any given time. So. What will be required to do, if I can elaborate on this, we'll meet with, with... Can't hear you. What will be required to do is we will meet with the Department of Public Works and do a scoping study. And, and planning as well, the planning APFO coordinator, Steve Cahoon, and they'll tell us which intersections to study. We'll have to study them during peak hours, morning and afternoon, during school time and summertime traffic. So they require us to do counts. That's why all, we, we're out there counting before school ends often, and then so we can get the summer as well. And those are the times we'll have to do. And recently, when I say recently, the past three years, the county's required Sunday afternoon counts. Not that they're trying to say, like, like Mr. Porter, I agree with Mr. Porter, the county's not trying to say, you're going to fix the Route 50 traffic because it's not realistic. But they want to know what it's going to be and what's going to happen on a Sunday afternoon. So we're doing counts on Sunday afternoons now, too, of all the developments I've been working on in the past two years. And, that, and that's a really important distinction is any, any traffic design in the county is not going to take into account an accident on Route 50. It's not going to take into account um, individual using um, traffic routing apps on their phones like Waze and other things which are going to take them through the communities. So a lot of what you see where you, where you have an hour for local traffic just to, to do what normally would be 15, that's an anomaly that's not considered in, in road design. Um, it's, it, it's considered but it's not, you know, we, we, we can't take into account, uh, you know, the Route 50 overflow and things like that in local traffic design. Not, not on an accident basis or, or an incident basis. It's, it's, uh, we do look at Sunday afternoons. We do look at Friday evenings. We look at that and, and include that in our design. But as far as any type of overflow as a result of an incident on 50 that, that occurs, it's, local traffic doesn't design that way. Okay. Do you have any? Can I? First thing we would have to do is get a um, resolution on the parking reduction. Is that doable? Uh, Madam Chair, before we go into that, um, wasn't there talk many moons ago about adding another overpass, a Dundee overpass? <laughs> <laughs> so another, another crossing over 50? Yes, there was, a, there was a Route 18 corridor study that occurred approximately six or seven years ago. Um, that was a discussion, a point of discussion. It currently is not high on the list of priorities for the state, so it's, I, but, would, I would say it's off the radar. Wouldn't that, in your opinion, wouldn't that lessen the, the burden at Dominion in 18? It would, yes. The state has acquired the right-of-way for it. It, had, it was purchased. All the right-of-way is purchased, but then they put it on the back burner. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's not considered a, a high priority for the for the state, and it's uh, you know as as uh, Mr. Stevens indicated, it's the right of ways there. All the all the everything's in place for when they pull the trigger, and it's a financial consideration. But right now, it's not a high priority for the state. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. When you uh, if if someone's going to make a motion on the parking, it would be important to include additionally what staff has suggested if you're going to make a motion to approve the parking reduction that the record reflects that um, if you're inclined that the uh, institutional use is likely to produce less need for parking um, and the mix of uses you know will allow a, a shared. shared parking and, and uh, reduce the need for parking Are you asking us to put that wording into the motion? If someone is going to make such a motion, it will be important for those facts to be included in the motion. Well, then you want to write it out so we know what we're saying? I have. You're wonderful. <laughs> if you're so inclined, I suggest that the, uh, the motion include language such as the following. The applicant has demonstrated that the mix of uses will generate uh, peak parking at different times during the day and an increase in shared parking. 
the independent living proposal will generate less parking need than the retail uses proposed in 2005. Madam Chair, if I can make the resolution, I'm going to then accept a friendly amendment from Chris to add that word because yes, I did not write that down. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We'll, we'll get you some stenography. Um, Robert's <laughs> rules, just trying to get it straight. Um, parking resolution. Resolved that the Planning Commission regarding the request by Reliable Real Estate Services, LLC, for a parking reduction from the required 569 spaces to 557 provided spaces under the provision of 181-83A, parenthesis 2, and as more particularly described in the planning and zoning file SP 20-10-006, hereby finds the reduction or reduced parking requirements would be consistent with the county commissioner's growth allocation condition number 11 and the planning commission uh, number 7, while allowing for additional landscaping in this area to meet county commissioner's condition number 9, and hereby grants the request for parking reduction. I have a correction on that. Can you correct the number to SP number 20-10-0065? You left the 6 out. I did? 20-10-0065? Mm -hmm. no, no. <laughs> yeah. You want to read the whole thing over? No. Oh, <laughs> I second. Please don't. Just checking. I accept that friendly amendment. Okay. Or correction. Okay. And grants the... Uh, but and you're adding the amendment. Well, we have to have the second, and then we'll accept the friendly amendment. Okay. Okay. Any second? Yes, second. Mr. Sylvester, Rolling second. Are oh, you want me to read it again? Yeah, because now the motion. Don't work. Oh, I'm sorry. The applicant has demonstrated that the mix of uses will generate peak parking at different times during the day and increase shared parking. The independent living proposal will generate less parking need than the retail uses proposed in 2005. I accept the friendly amendment. I second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, growth allocation. Want me to read this again? Yes, uh, please. Since, since we don't have our normal person. Yeah. <laughs> Resolved that the planning commission regarding the request by reliable real estate services LLC for confirmation that the current proposal SP number 20-10-0065 is consistent with the original growth allocation award and the develop and development proposal hereby finds the current proposal is consistent with the 2005 concept plan growth allocation award and conditions the consistency indicates that no changes are needed to the required condition planning commission county commissioners as they required through the granting of the 2005 growth allocation award number three the current concept plan is consistent with the 2022 county comprehensive plan and the critical area program as required by the growth allocation standards found in Article 15, growth allocation of the Queen Anne's County Code of Public Law, and hereby confirms that the current proposal is consistent with the original concept plan, growth allocation award, and conditions. Second. All in favor? Oh, four. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So be it. Concept plan. It is resolved that the Planning Commission regarding the request by Reliable Real Estate Services LLC for the concept plan approval for the creation of an approximately 142,830 square foot commercial development that will include four uh, restaurants, office space, retail space, a grocery store, and a senior independent living facility, and as more particularly described in the Department of Planning and Zoning file SP 20-10-0065, hereby finds that the current concept plan is consistent with the goals and objective of the Queen Anne's County Zoning and Subdivision re Regulations and the 2022 Comprehensive Plan 
and hereby grants the concept plan approval subject to the following conditions. Any remaining edits and or documents required by the State Highway Administration, the Department of Public Works, Planning and Zoning, or any other reviewing agency be reviewed and approved. The architecture and overall site design must substantially reflect the documents provided. The administrative subdivision must be approved and recorded prior to the final uh, site plan signature and all remaining details of growth allocation condition need to be completed prior to final site plan review by the Planning Commission. We have a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So be it. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Gentlemen. We're going to take a recess.
like get rid of me, I think. Okay. Bringing the meeting back to back to order. Um, concept plan, Chesapeake Square, A and W Investments. Steve Johnson. Good morning. Good morning. Steve Johnson, County Planner. Um, as you stated, we're here to discuss Dare Chesapeake Square that. Apartments. Uh, it's Oops. file number SP22-01-0084. Uh, the applicant, Mr. Azar, is proposing to construct two three-story, 21-unit residential apartment buildings and a 232-square-foot pavilion. Um, it's also proposing an increase of den in density of up to 20 units per acre. It's requesting increased density per 18128D, 2A1F, and concept plan approval. Uh, this slide gives you a general location of the location of the project. As you can see, it's located in Chester. More specifically, uh, it's tax map 57, parcel 481. It totals 2.134 acres, and it's located off of Main Street north of Route 50 between Friendlies and Queenstown Bank. Um, everyone in here may recognize this as the Island Professional Park. That's the Huts. That's Zone Town Center. Uh, it falls within the Chester-Stevensville growth area. Five, uh, 0.536 acres are in the critical area, the LDA designation. Um, it's not located within a 100-foot our 100 year floodplain, and there are no natural resources, steep slopes, or endangered species on the property. It's important to note <coughs> that this parcel is legally non conforming with regard to lot coverage in the critical area, and the lot coverage in critical area will be reduced by 0 0.023 acres as part of this proposal. Uh, these are the existing conditions. This is looking northeast, oh. this is looking northwest from Route 18. Here on the right, you can see a view of the concept plan. The two apartment buildings are highlighted in blue. The pavilion's off to the right. Um, it's kind of small, but it's highlighted in blue as well. Um, density for apartment development in the TC zoning district is 10 units per acre. Under 181-28D2A1F in the growth area, the planning commission may increase the density for apartment dwelling or development to 20 units per acre provided the following five conditions are met. Um, those conditions were discussed in your staff report and additionally the applicant provided a narrative explaining how they meet those conditions which was also attached to your staff report. <coughs> Conceptually all the town center residential development standards are met. Uh, the property is to be served by public water and sewer Stormwater has been provided on site and will continue to be reviewed and approved by DPW. The applicant has provided all the required parking spaces, which is 78 total. Forest conservation will be met on site, or excuse me, upland forest conservation will be met on site by the planting of a 0.24 acre afforestation area, which is highlighted in green on your screen. Uh, it's important to note as well that that area, excuse me, that area will also be utilized to provide screening from the parking lot to the adjacent commercial uses. Critical area afforestation requirements uh, will be met by the planting of a 0 0.08 acre afforestation area, which is highlighted in fuchsia on your screen. Uh, both of these areas will be under long-term uh, forest conservation easements. Uh, this slide gives you an idea of how the property will look uh, as it relates to the existing development. These are the architectural, architectural renderings of the property. This is looking north, northwest from Route 18. Uh, this is looking to the northeast from Route 18. Um, this is looking towards the south, southeast from behind building number two, which is the building at the rear. Uh, this is looking from the parking lot towards the southwest. Uh, here's a bird's eye view of the property as it may look. Uh, it's important to note also that the trees uh, don't exist that surround this building. It's not that heavily wooded. 
Here's another view. And it's, I just wanted to point this out that Mr. Azar uh, constructed Chesapeake Village Center down the road. Uh, the architecture for this project is very similar to what you see on the screen. That was deemed to meet TCUC and, uh, design standards and was approved. <coughs> With that, I'll take any questions or turn it over to the applicant. Mr. Davis. Good morning. Tom Davis with DMS and Associates. Um, this is David Azar. Um, he's the owner and developer. Um, I have a pretty extensive history on this property. Uh, when I first got out of college in 1985, I actually did the civil engineering this for Miss Mary Lou Rosendale when she developed what we call affectionately the huts. Uh, the condo documents. Yeah. Uh, David and his wife purchased the property. Um, they're currently renting the commercial spaces. Um, the buildings are in a fairly bad state of disrepair. Dave can attest to that. And uh, Dave and his family have done this successful project down the road called Chesapeake Village Center. And they're looking at this as an extension of the the rental housing uh, community, uh, very similar architecture, uh, very similar uh, apartments, uh, you know, uh, for rents, uh, you know, affordable affordable rents. And uh, we did have a community meeting uh, at Dave's office. Nobody from the surrounding area showed up to the meeting, uh, and that's related to the bonus density that we're requesting. Uh, Ten is permitted by right. 20 uh, is requested for this project for the bonus uh, density. Um, we believe that we meet all the requirements for that bonus density uh, as indicated in the staff report. Stormwater management will be addressed very similar to uh, projects that have been done by a retention area in the uh, center of the parking lot. Uh, if you go to Dave's Chesapeake Village Center, we have those very similar by retention systems uh, or in, the, in the middle of the parking lot as well as along the perimeter of the building. Uh, as Steve mentioned, forest conservation will be addressed on site and uh, forest, uh, afforestation requirements for the critical area will be best uh, addressed there on the upper left of the, the layout. Uh, we feel that this is a good use in this area. It provides a housing component in this little commercial area that will support maybe housing for some of the businesses, uh, you know, employees that may work at the uh, Ken Island Shopping Center where the Call Classic is or McDonald's or whatever. There's, there's really no affordable housing, rental housing in this general area. So we think it's a pretty good use uh, in this area. There's amenities that the tenants of these uh, rental apartments can go to, McDonald's, there's an ice cream shop, you know, so everything um, that could be needed it, it would be in, within walking distance of, of this area. So, Dave, you want to elaborate on that? And I think just that um, we should probably touch on how the parking um, versus traffic flows may go differently than the previous applicant um, just because of the location of the property. Um, and Tom can speak more to that than I can, but <clears throat> that is off of um, Main Street by Western Auto. So there is a more direct connection to Route 50 there. Um, we're on that side already where we are in walking distance to the existing strip stores that offer the different things that Tom has already mentioned. Um, on top of that, I, I just want to say to this board that um, when I build, I build, I think, at a top level. We can prove that with the certifications I received from the property up the street. We have the only two, <clears throat> first two and only two buildings to reach the highest green building standard from the National Green Building Standard in Maryland, and there's, only, there's under 20 in the entire nation. So we think we're bringing something that's not just needed to the community, but at a good level for all of us that have to live here and see it. You will have to terminate the, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with this, you're gonna have to terminate the condo regime. That was one of my first commercial condo regimes for Mary Lou back, what, 30 years ago, was it, Tom? 
but has to, ha he has to. What, we can't hear you. What are you saying? <laughs> it's got nothing to do with the zoning thing, but there's a condominium regime on oh. the property. Each of the huts is a is mm -hmm. a condominium unit, so that would have to be terminated from a title point of view. That's all. Yeah. First, okay. I've heard of that, but okay. <laughs> Free legal counsel. Yes, <laughs> thank you, sir. Appreciate it. So, um, I heard Mr. Davis mention that these are affordable units. They have to meet certain requirements uh, to, to request the boning bonus density, and that we we meet those. And to speak of that, you, I mean, we're all. I'm sure we all hear the news and what have you. But there, you know, there are projects throughout the United States currently that are hitting the news where the owners and or managers of the properties they're jacking the rents you know ridiculous amounts four hundred six hundred two thousand um, dollars we've raised our rents fifty dollars in the last year and i'm certain that water sewer has been raised more than that on the property which means we're well within the market and livability that people would hopefully expect in our area. Yeah, for, for the rental apartments, the I think the housing department for the county dictates what is affordable, so you would have to adhere to those rental rates. Out of curiosity, do you have any clue what they are currently? I'm sorry? Out of curiosity, do you have any clue what the rental rates are currently? Absolutely. For like a two bedroom or three sure. bedroom well, for, for the housing? Well, the Housing Authority, I believe their latest um, was, is it 1650 from, from the Housing Authority standpoint. Yeah, so three bedrooms, 1750, and that's through the Housing Authority. Now, market rates are higher than that, but, right. but we blend all of those because we have many different tenants. I have a, a veteran living on our property that you know, his, his rent is only $1,100 a month in a two-bedroom on my new property. That's just part of what we do, but... Good. Good for you. Yes. Okay, do we have any questions? Um, public comment? Barry? Barry Waterman, Centerville. Um, I'm sure you're all aware, but there's a housing crisis across the country. Um, we, we've underbuilt housing for 10 or 15 years since the last crash. Queen Anne's County, that situation is much worse because we've underbuilt housing for the last 30 some years. We graduate roughly 600 students from our high school every year, and over the last 20 years, if we built 200 houses a year, I'd be surprised. Uh, I just did a search a minute ago. There is a total in the multiple listing service of properties for rent, one. One house in all of Queen Anne's County is for rent right now. It's $3,000 a month. Right. Um, projects like what Dave's proposing are, are urgently needed. Where do, where do young people go when they're uh, ready to go out on their own? Where do people go when they get divorced? Where, you know, when they're, when they're uh, retired? Where, where are they going to go um, if, we don't, if we don't have more affordable options like apartments? We, we really are just going to continue to get into a worse and worse situation where, where no one can afford to live here. Thanks. Okay. Any questions? Motion. Other comment? Okay, there being none. Can we get a resolution? Motion. Resolve that the planning commission regarding the request by a and W Investments, LLC, for approval of an increased density under 18-1-28D, parentheses 2, parentheses A, uh, I, uh, F. I think that's a 1. Is that a 1? Thank you. 1, F, to construct two three-story, 21-unit residential apartment buildings with a density of up to 20 units per acre, and as more particularly described in the planning and zoning file SP 20-01-084, hereby finds the site area does not exceed five acres. Architectural uh, 
elevations have been provided and are compatible with the surrounding development. Uh, the apartment development will provide workforce age restricted or other moderately priced housing. Landscaping is provided by screening from the adjacent commercial properties and a public meeting was conducted and hereby grants the increase in density of up to 20 units per acre. Uh, correction. Correction. Yeah, you want to reread that number. SP 22-01-0084. I did that. Yeah, you left a couple of them out. <laughs> Sharon's got gotcha. you. Sure. Okay. 22-01-0084. We're good. <laughs> I must hear something different. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I accept that friendly amendment. <laughs> uh, Bill, you can do something. I'll, I'll be glad to second that. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I'm almost afraid to read the next one. <laughs> Resolved with the Planning Commission regarding the request by A&W Investments LLC for concept plan approval for redevelopment of one parcel along Main Street to include two three-story, 21-unit residential apartment buildings and a 232-square-foot pavilion, and as more particularly described by the Department of Planning and Zoning file, SP 22-01-0084 hereby finds the concept plan is consistent with the goals and objectives of Queen Anne's County zoning and subdivision re regulations and the 2022 comprehensive plan and hereby grants the concept plan approval subject to the following conditions. Any remaining edits and or documents required by the reviewing agency, the Department of Public Works or planning and zoning to be reviewed and approved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do that one quickly. Um, do you need another break? If we want to keep on going. Let's keep on going. I hope we get out of here this morning. <laughs> Okay, we have citizen-sponsored text amendments. Um, Taco 2202. You, Stephanie, are you going to give us a short mm, yep. review All on right, each so one? As Sharon said, this is uh, citizen-sponsored text amendment 2202. Um, the intent here um, is to allow for, as an accessory use, recreational um, vehicles for overnight parking um, in conjunction with a bona fide fraternal organization within the WVC. Um, so the WVC is basically the, the Kent Narrows area, just so you have that in your head. Um, basically, the, they have um, proposed some stipulations that it not to exceed 15 RVs, that it um, not be more than four consecutive days, that they're um, basically who's staying there is a member of the organization or they are a guest of the organization that's um, there for an on-site activity. And also that there's no waste disposal at the site, basically. Um, so looking at the code, something that's very similar to this is a campground. Um, campgrounds are permitted as conditional uses in other districts, um, the agricultural district, countryside, uh, the Kent Island suburban commercial, and then the suburban commercial districts. Um, the amendment doesn't indicate necessarily, so it says four consecutive days. Um, it doesn't indicate whether there's going to be a point in time where there's no RVs there. So you could have some there from, for example, Friday to Monday for an on-site activity. And 365 days. <laughs> yeah, and then you could have, you know, Tuesday to, you know, whatever the following days would be. So that is something you probably really want to look at. Um, also, the, the use of the word on-site activity um, the code doesn't define that in any way, um, so it really could just be very something very vague and something simple. Um, another term that the code does use is special events, um, and that's a 
an approval through the Board of Appeals, but the way the special events works is it outlines a number of days, for example, that someone could have a special event at a site. Um, the way the, the planning department reviews that is every year the um, property owner has to submit a um, zoning certificate that outlines the days basically that they're going to be using that site for an event. So it, it allows a, basically an enforcement you know, to go out and check to see if it's being used <coughs> on those days, and then it captures it on a yearly basis. So the the idea of that um, really captures the the on-site activity more as a special event, um, and gives it a little bit more meaning, per se, than just a activity. Um, so the applicant uh, is the applicant. You guys want to come up and sit, but um, if the, the planning uh, commission is inclined to send a favorable recommendation, there is a list of things I've outlined in your staff report that you might want to discuss um, to take a look at or, you know, ask the applicant before doing so. Suppose an on-site activity could be visiting your friends on their boat. Right, yeah, it could be very something very vague and very like, minute. It like they want to turn it into a camping ground. Do we have any way of monitoring four days? Uh, like I said, through the, the special event, but you could put it, you could propose that it's only um, four days and that the other days that has to be vacant. We basically. really don't have people sitting on the shelf able to do that. Either. Yeah, I mean, I, it would it's, put, it's a lot of enforcement. Uh, for enforcement to go down there and check that all the time. This arose because I think zoning enforcement, someone either complained or one of the zoning inspectors noticed that there were RVs parked at the Yacht Club. I would say they're doing it anyway. Well, they're not anymore because they were told. To they can't. Okay. Uh, I'm Jeff Smith, the Commodore of Canal and Yacht Club. We've been doing the RV area since we were developed in 1952. Um, the uh, problems came when we terminated a couple of members and they sought out any way they could to uh, give us issues. Uh, they traditionally, the, the cars, the, the RVs, are they're only there for the four days over the weekend. They're not typically there for the, during the middle of the week unless there is a special event. Do they come every weekend? Because if they had their boat there, wouldn't they come every weekend? They don't necessarily come every weekend. It, every it, other weekend? It fluctuates um, a, a great deal. There are some that come there, would like to come there a lot. <laughs> the way we have it set up is they make a reservation. They can stay there for four days, and they can't make another res reservation until after that. Uh, so it gives the uh, members of the club an opportunity to uh, utilize that space. How do you handle pump outs and things like that? With the four days, they typically don't need a pump out, but if they do, we call um, the uh, truck, which I can't think of, <coughs> Ruth Brothers uh, Sewage Company to come Who was it? Ruth Brothers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Certified. And what about water? Yeah. I'm sorry? Water. What do they do for water? I know they have. We don't have county capacity. water over there. We have well water. Okay. And we typically just run a hose. And, and they have water tanks similar to what the boats have anyway. It's just something that um, it, it's evolved where people get out of the boating and they get into a, a RV instead as their uh, <coughs> reflexes are not as good as for running a boat. But we have um, a lot of activities going on that they, they like to participate in. When we, uh, I mean, we have music every weekend. And, we just had the car show and boat show there, but it's a private club, yeah. and we've been enjoying doing this for a long time until someone complained, and we weren't aware that we weren't if, supposed if, to be doing it. If they've been doing it since 1952, isn't it kind of like grandfathered in? <coughs> Maybe. Uh, there's been no evidence that that's the case. I, I mean, think, that's 70 years. Well, we've been told that, but there's no <coughs> evidence of that. And as an accessory use, if that's all it ever was, I'm not sure. 
non legal non-conforming uses deal with the principal use of the property, not necessarily an accessory use. <coughs> so I, I haven't thought it through all the way, but we also haven't been provided with any evidence that the that this use has been ongoing since 1964 when the first zoning became was enacted in the county. Can you can you give us? I'm not um, sure that the answer is going to be what the yacht club wants, even if it can demonstrate that. And I can. Right. Well, I understand that, but still, if they could give us the proof, that would go a long way in their direction. I can offer you some background on to that point. Uh, staff has investigated the historic use. Uh, we did investigate the violation uh, on the property and took enforcement action, and that is why uh, we're looking at this application now to come into a legal compliance uh, to continue that use. So um, our zoning administrator and I did some research uh, to corroborate that that use had been you know, long-standing and grandfathered, but the, the fact is we could not substantiate, uh, often with aerial imagery that we have, and our GIS department is incredible, and they have on our website, on the property viewer, uh, they have aerial layers dating back to the 30s. So uh, often because of resources like that, it's easier <coughs> for us to substantiate a non-conforming use to show that uh, something was there over time, but there was no evidence of uh, campground use or RV parking throughout those years in those aerial images, likely because it has been a light use, uh, uh, which is being indicated. Um, I think it wasn't high on the county's enforcement radar because it was such a light use and it was often a weekend use and we don't have inspectors um, who work on the weekends. So I think that the testimony that you're receiving is accurate in that it is what has been traditionally there has been a light enough accessory use that we can't substantiate it um, through documentation. And I think we did discuss uh, finding photo documentation over time and that just wasn't we have a lot of photos from the boat races that were held there annually for many, many years that helped out the whole island. But um, I'd, I'd like to say that the Ken Island Yacht Club is a private member club that was established in 52, purpose of boating, fishing, social gathering, recreational activities, and more. Ken Island uh, Yacht Club resides on 10 acres listed on tax map as 0057, parcel 0445. RVs can promote a family life and a natural complement to boating. KIYC is a section of property it would like to continue to use for recreation, recreational vehicles as it has members and reciprocating clubs for many, many years. That use has been and would continue to be limited to a four-day stay per visit. For the most part, this area and RVs are difficult to be seen from Route 18 or 50 due to all the trees on our north and east sides, and we plan it more for this purpose. Metered electric was specifically installed in this area for the purpose of RV stays nearly 30 years ago. In the past, RVs clustered around two metered outlet areas with cords laying across the field, and we feel having cords and connections on ground that can create a safety hazard, therefore we do wish to establish raised outlets spread out where the RVs can park without having electrical connections on the ground. Typically, due to the short extent of the stay, pump outs are not required. However, if they are, a Ruth Brother septic is called. When the club hosted the boat races, this entire area and every piece of space on each side of Yacht Club Drive was occupied by RVs and race boat trailers. We fully understand that requires a special permit for that. We're seeking to limit RVs to 15 approximately 25% of the grass area that's in that specific area, so not to crowd the space, yet still serve our members. KIYC is quite unique in that while it has almost 60 slips for members' annual dockage, it reserves approximately 750 linear feet specifically for transients. Most clubs utilize empty member slips when members are away. However, this practice makes it difficult for visitors boating to plan. 
Therefore, KIYC attracts fellow yacht clubs from up and down the eastern seaboard. They frequently stop here on their way to and from north to south. These people enjoy the entire Kent Narrows area in the spirit that uh, Waterfront Village Center is intended to promote. Recreational facilities, mixed uses, recreational uses, tourism, recreational activities, and even parking facilities are phrases throughout the WVC writings. Where else can people park an RV in this area? When the club began, the RVs had ice boxes, but things evolved, and now they have refrigerators, air conditioning, TVs, etc. Consequently, the need for the installation of electric. One of the great aspects of our specific arrangement is that this is a grass area used for the above described use each weekend without altering the grass. The lawn they park on still must be mowed each week, and our goal of 15 RV outlets on six by six posts takes up 540 square inches of so the approximately 5,930,496 square inch area. Our current zoning would permit us to fill the meadow with boats on trailers for expended periods of time, but it's not our goal to have inactive parking, even though that would generate great revenue for the club. Again, in the spirit of the WVC, the RVs would benefit the entire community since the owners are here and active. In closing, KIYC wants to provide for its members while contributing to our community in a way that is environmentally friendly. The club frequently hosts QAC Drug Free Coalition, Rotary Club, Chamber of Commerce fundraisers, and for community needs, and is since since 1952. KIYC has a long, proud history of contributing to the area and wants to continue that legacy. Okay. Um, what's the pleasure of the... Commodore, do we don't maintain a log of, of people who are parking there? I mean, I guess back to Amy's question of no, no way of validating are these members or guests we, of the members... We do maintain a log, the same as we do with the uh, uh, boat, um, boats that come in for uh, dockage. Right. And that, that log wasn't sufficient to show that this had been something that the Yacht Club had been doing for some time? Unfortunately, in the past, until we changed our accounting system, they were logging them the same way as boats, so we couldn't distinguish the two efficiently. Okay. Now we do, or will. Uh, the amendment as proposed, this is subsec this is should be subsection D. <clears throat> Occupants may stay overnight if they are members or guests of the organization and then and or engaged in an on site activity. We take out all the words we could say occupants of the recreational vehicle may stay overnight if engaged in an on-site activity. In other words, that person need not be a member or a guest of a member. Is that what you intended? I don't think that's quite, the way that you describe it may not be quite as I intended, or okay. we intended. Uh, but it's, when, you, when you do it the way you, you have it written, it sounds like you're going to allow someone to stay there just every weekend whenever, for whatever reason. And the on-site activity would be camping at the Yacht Club. I don't yeah. think that's what you intended, but no, that's it's what really the words not. say. No, it's for members and reciprocating clubs. Essentially a transient boat slip on land. Yes. For a member or a reciprocating or reciprocating. Correct. Correct. What if I am the brother of a member and the member brother invites me to spend four days at the Yacht Club and therefore I would be a guest? You would be a guest to that member. Yes, we would want that. You have, you have a problem with the TV? Oh, there's nothing oh, yeah, on there's it. There's nothing to show. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So, so, Chris, are you suggesting that we delete the and or engaged in the on site activity? Parse out exactly what it is that the Yacht Club is trying to accomplish. Right. So, so no one should be on the property that's not a guest of the Yacht Club or a member of the Yacht Club. That's correct. 
Okay, so well, a guest of the yacht club could be someone who rents a space to engage in the on-site activity, which is staying at the yacht club for right. the weekend. It just serves its own purpose. Yeah, I don't think that's what's intended. Well, we might have, like, for instance, an entertainer might bring in there uh, yeah. to do the entertainment for us. Maybe able to stay there. How do we enforce this? Well, no, it's something we've been doing for many, many years, it seems, and, and we take great pride in our property and our uh, relationship with the community, and uh, I feel that we can self-enforce this. But if you need something further, any suggestions would be appreciated. In, in our packet, there's a letter from the Kent Narrows Development Foundation. Are you part of that? Yes, sir. So they've made a couple of suggestions for changes to the text amendment? Yes. Uh, spe specifically, uh, I'm not sure what they mean by the ch in the change 5D, which we'll get into, but in 5A it says change uh, shall be accessory to and permitted only as a part of bona fide fraternal organization, dot, dot, dot. But change that as part of to on land owned by. I assume they mean, you know, they're, they're concerned somebody from the Development Foundation would have to explain why that they need that change. They're worried about your RVs parking on their property? No, I think what they were worried about is some other fraternal organization coming in and renting a piece of property somewhere uh, around and then saying that we're a fraternal organization, we should be allowed this. Whereas we're already established and have been established for a long time and are a property owner, not a renter. So you're not, you don't object to the foundation's proposal to modify it to owned by? No, I absolutely encourage that. That, that was their concern. The, Pardon me? That was their concern, um, what he reiterated. But the proposed amendment specifically says that it's basically for um, fraternal organizations that are in operation of the date of the amendment, if the amendment is to pass. So you're saying that the way it's written, it's already taken uh, care yeah, of that? I, I think so. Okay, and that, well, let's ask, we'll hit the second one then, sec, uh, 5D. Uh, it says, or occupants of the recreational vehicle may stay overnight in the recreational vehicle if they are members or guests, no. dot, dot, dot. And, and the proposed change is member guest. I don't know what that means. Uh, uh, Anybody? Well, the uh, well, that just means that the foundation it, here. it would have to be somebody affiliated or or uh, someone that one of our guests knew that invited. That's what I was hoping this fellow would get up and talk about it. <laughs> Can you explain to us after you introduce yourself, you. sir? <laughs> um, good morning, Jody Schultz. Uh, I guess my hat today is the uh, chairman of the Kent Narrows Development Foundation. So we have been discussing this with, with Jeff for quite a while. Um, understand he's been doing this, and I think he explained they didn't know they were doing anything wrong until they were told. And the comment on um, that we made um, on land owned, um, we, we didn't want it to turn into a campground area. So as an example, we didn't want uh, Jamal's as an example to be able to turn that property into a, a campground so that's why we suggested um, on land owned by a, uh, how would that stop Jamal he would have to turn his property into a bona fide uh, nonprofit I guess and, and meet the, the, the spirit of this text amendment is the yacht club nonprofit yes which, I, you know, we didn't feel like that was, I guess it's not impossible, but I guess that's quite a journey for And a very departure from his ways. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't, you know, we're trying to be sympathetic with what the Huck Club's trying to do and find a way that allowed them to pr proceed with that. And I think the suggestion on member guests m meant just that with their bylaws, a member's guest is defined. And just to say, hey, you're my guest, where which would Ms. Preclude, could come in. Which would preclude his his um, band from coming there and spending the night. Yeah, and I don't. And we've we've had several meetings with Jeff about this, and and uh, you know I, I think we're um, 
sympathetic about about what they've been doing and understand that if this text amendment passes that it's not going to turn into anything other than he they've been doing for the past potentially 70 years you know they're not going to have a you got to be a member it's a private club their their intent is not to be overrun as he explained to us with a bunch of out of town campers in a campground um, situation and that's really not what we want in, in Canton Arrows um, at all. So that was there, a couple suggestions. And I mean, we feel comfortable that, that they're gonna police what they've been doing and we'll certainly help oversee that if as best we can. If, if we approve this text amendment, there's nothing to say and we can't foresee every little thing in the future with regard to what somebody might try to do or not do with our property which mm -hmm. may or may not be appropriate there's nothing that says we can't bring this text amendment back and, and abridge it right change it i'm sorry there's some uh, your mouth is oh, I'm behind sorry. jeff Reese's okay name there, so, so use nobody uses complaint about not being able to hear me <laughs> um <laughs> so if we approve this text amendment like it's written because it's kind of seems like a solution and looking at looking for a problem to me um but somebody takes advantage of the lack of an apostrophe or a comma or whatever we are within our rights to bring this text amendment back and abridge it aren't we uh yeah but in the meantime whoever has taken advantage of the apostrophe and gotten a permit would then be legally non-conforming if you change to change it to outlaw it and just to be clear, you guys are providing a recommendation to the county commissioners. You're not approving anything. Just okay, so, thank yeah, you. I, need so you know. I do think uh, if we so on D, if you uh, put a period after organization yeah. and took out the rest, that might clear up some of yeah. the uncertainty. I agree. That takes care of the reciprocal you know, situation, takes care of the members. And you avoid the uh, potential entanglement of, you know, or engaged in some other activity. Then they don't really have to be a member. It just it just says that they yes. have to be. Yes. So just yeah. right. take it out, clean it up, protect the club you know, from getting. We would have no objection to that. I'm a, I'm okay. a little uncertain, Stephanie, about the concern about four days. Yes, I have a big concern about that. that. Can you give us that again, please? So the four days. Um, it says it's for four consecutive days. Um, so that would be as in they could have someone there, you know, like I said, Friday to Monday and then Tuesday to the following four days. Um, so somehow the, in, in the proposal, it needs to document how that's going to work, because otherwise it's operating just like a campground, um, which that's what people do, you know, in and out. And that's that's the intent of it. Um, so somehow it needs to be indicated in the code that, you know, there's people there for four days and that, you know, that there's a lapse of time until the next four days, I think. Um, or somehow, even better, that um, that the, the occupant or whoever, the basically Ken Island Yacht Club, would submit a, um, a um, sorry, a zoning certificate every year indicating that when they're having these special events um, so that we know that, and also the planning department and enforcement officers know that when people are gonna be staying there in those four days you know, when those four days would fall. Except this is not intended to be affiliated only with special events. Right. But I think they're, they're, the intent of the special events is what happens is the following of that after the approval of the Board of Appeals, the special event requirement is that they submit a zoning certificate every year indicating when their special events are going to be so that Enforcement. If not, what if they're not having any special events? Does that mean that they can't have the RVs on site? Well, then they, I guess they wouldn't submit an, a, a zoning certificate that year, but they would have to know a year in advance when they submit it to the, because yeah. on-site activity is a very vague, vague term and for enforcement to be out there all the time and checking it is, um, it's not easy on enforcement. Well, the suggested change eliminates that wording. Well, somehow we need to, I think, be able to document the, the four days and how it's um, going to operate, that it's, someone's not going to be there all the time. There really isn't any, any reason why the guy can't 
park there for four days and then Monday afternoon decide to drive out of there and go up to Safeway and drive back in. Drive back in. Yep. And he starts his four days again. Right. The way it's written. I, Just saying. To the years I've been there, I'm a member almost 25 years and uh, I just don't, nobody's staying that length of time um, beyond that. Obviously, so, that's not the intent. But we like to live under the little red bus theory. Understood. <laughs> but if the code allows it, then there's no way to enforce it not being like Sharon has said. Exactly. I mean, how do you enforce anything? You only enforce it when there's a complaint. I mean, you can't expect yeah. county, and I don't have a horse in a race. I'm just, we're just, I think, trying to find a happy medium, but no, any, any violation is, yeah. I mean, it's not enforceable to, I guess, you get a complaint, and, and they've got some. And then they got rid of all the RVs when they had the complaint. Some antagonizers that have brought this whole issue forward, and they're trying right. to get it resolved, so I'm, I'm pretty sure if they're violating something that's, that they're going to, you're going to get a call about that. Well. And I think I, the point that uh, Stephanie was making in comparing this documentation to a special event wasn't intended to frame this as a special event, but to use some of that language as guidance. So uh, what is enforceable is what is documented in the code and in a subsequent building permit. So I think that if language were added that um, specified uh, as a special event does, that this use um, is intermittent and may not exceed by any one occupant X number of days a year. Um, I know with this special event that is a, what is it, 180 days? Well, that's, um, no, we're talking, we're mixing up special events, I think, yeah. with temporary uses. Yeah. Okay, yes, with a temporary use. I think that this, connecting this with a temporary use permit in terms of limiting the number of consecutive days and days that any one member can utilize, that might be something that we can quantify and receive um, documentation with a temporary use permit. And then that is enforceable. And they have to get one every year, right? And they would have to get one every right. year. That would make more sense. That could give, make everybody happy. And then Jeff, if that uh, is a condition of a favorable review by this board, then by the, when you um, get to the commissioner level, could work out the mechanics of how that suits your needs and gives the county something to enforce. Maybe this then should go in the temporary use section. So that only gives them six Rather months. than total. I think Vivian preferred it Good not to be a temporary. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, she's not here, but I will state okay. that. <laughs> but I think you can still put that provision in the standard oh, okay. um, that sets that parameter. I think we can still use the intention of that language and place an additional um, provision within this use to capture that. But what do you Com think? Commodore, for clarification, <laughs> you're not asking for this parking just for special events. You're asking for this. We could have or a member's use. It, it could be almost just transitory. It could be, you know, a member of, you know, any yacht club along the coast that's going to park their RV place. there, make use of the facilities at the yacht club, and then be on their way down the road. So special events, my concern is you, you narrow that down. And I think by the reference that Chris made earlier and or engaged in on-site activities, you, know, you don't need that. You just keep this as members and members guests specifically. You maintain a log of the people that are on the site. That log gives us the opportunity to go back and say, well, this person was there six days. Well, I don't know what the penalty is if they're there six days instead of four, but a log of at least being able to go back and see what the club is doing to manage the four consecutive days on site. You, you, I mean, you can manage this, I think, but um, I don't want to tie it into special events. And I, and I think getting out uh, the fact that we're engaged in 
you know, on-site activities, take that out. So it's got to be a member. I mean, I'm a member of the Yacht Club. It's got to be a member. It's got to be, guess. you know, a guest. So, it, it, you know, for full disclosure, I think you got it restricted, and I think that's what the club would do. We had no yeah, idea I think this. We misspoke with the special event. So, I mean, we're just using that language. Um, but I, I understand your point. I think the deletion of that terminology in Section D is a good idea. But with, absent some clarification in Item C, um, there is no way of quantifying it or enforcing other than a gentleman's agreement. So, um, and that isn't the way the code can operate. So we need something to quantify that. Yeah, I agree. Well, I, I agree, you need to quantify it. However, I don't think making it a temporary use um, makes that happen. By making it a temporary use, they have 180 days total. So if I start in, in March, that means by August, I'm no longer allowed to, to use that application or that location. We weren't suggesting that to make it a temporary use. That's why it is included where it is. But I think we can steal some of that language to make it a condition within this use to help us to quantify so that we have language that's consistent elsewhere in the plan. So, um, Jeff, would you be a, amenable to having a log of, you know, uh, Bob Smith coming in for four days, coming in on the first and leaving on the, on the fourth? and and logging those independently? We would, we would do that anyway. And I had no idea this would get this complicated um, for something we've been doing for years and are entertaining for our members. But we're amicable to do uh, what's needed, but I don't want to make it overly complicated where if we don't do something, we're totally messed up. I, I don't. The Yacht Club is really there and, and has policed itself uh, quite well and as soon as we were told we were doing something wrong we rectified that situation um, we are there as a part of the community we're not uh, and we're trying to do things right can you do some wording that'll get us through this quickly as in today I could if I understood. Or you could I offer, if you wanted to offer support conditioned upon um, well, if we need them, yeah. Jeff working with staff to address um, the matter. I like of, that. I like that word, conditional. You did that last year for the solar amendment, so it is something you've done. Conditional now. approval. And then rather than trying to come up with something on the fly, we can sit down. Uh, with Jeff and come up with a language to be presented to the commissioners that is appropriate yeah. and then we can report back to you next month on what okay yeah. you want to make that preferably since it's a nonprofit and they offer charitable services to various organizations in the county it'll be at no cost to them well it already is a no cost application <laughs> okay because I'm just <laughs> making my point about how it's I feel no about cost this for all the yeah, it's, it's this is a uh, since, since it's limited to a fraternal organization that owns the property, it, it pretty well limits it to us, our, our situation. So uh, I don't quite understand the uh, well, apprehension. Yeah, but, but, but. Uh, there's a couple. No good deed goes unpunished. <laughs> American Legion could turn theirs into an RV park or BFW could or... So, do we need to ask for public comment? Yeah. <clears throat> we do? Okay. Do you have any more you want to say at the moment? I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> any public comment? <laughs> uh, Jim Riley, I'm a member, uh, actually a member of the club, uh, Ken Hahn resident in Chester. It seems to me keeping a log that can be reviewed is the solution to your four-day problem. I, this doesn't need to be any more complicated than that. And I guess I'm really frustrated at how complicated it's become. It's like a, trying to solve a problem that's a non-problem. Non okay. Any other com comment? You don't know how many times we've heard that in the past? 
and then gotten, uh, as they say, hoisted on our own petard. You have to be careful every time there's a text in there. What? Mr. Smart, the, the, the choice of four consecutive days, is, the rationale behind that was that you're not promoting longer stays? No, the rationale, well, in part, yes, it, we're not. And it's also to give other members, because we're limited to the amount of spaces we can have, we want to give everyone in our club or reciprocating clubs an opportunity to use the space because it is so beautiful. I understand, but I'm, I'm, I'm a boater. A transient slip renter, and I just I'm I'm in town, and I'm I'm playing two weekends of golf. I now have to move my RV off your facility that I'm enjoying and going out to dinner and various restaurants because of four days. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. I, it's it was a hypothetical. Because uh, another person may want to use it the next weekend and play golf where you were going to. But if if there is no, so. if you've got plenty of space. And you're happy with my res my temporary residence at your facility? I'm just we we limited to four days. After that four days, you could make another reservation, um, and 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 which a goes different back date to, goes back to Stephanie's comments. Okay. So this you do the same thing for the boats that you do for the RVs. Sure. You we only do. allow them to stay four days. Right. <clears throat> but if there's an empty slip and they don't have a reservation, why not rent it for a fifth day? but not a 15th day or a 25th day. Gotcha. Because I would see where that would be beneficial as a guest. So, right. uh, we're all so we're not going to vote on this now because we're, we're going to oh, get some Yes, work. we are. We're going to do it. We're going to vote on it now and do the conditional that they have to work with staff to get wording right before they present it to the commissioners. That's a suggestion. That's not a directive. Yeah, I mean, I, I would think that we just wait for the wording to be worked out and vote on the wording at one time because we're going to vote on the wording when they come and back, bring it back. Yeah. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. The idea would be if what Amy is suggesting that you might consider giving it a favorable recommendation to the commissioners on the condition that language be added to deal with this, how to track this four day limitation I would like to see if we can proceed forward in such a way that we don't um, encumber our members any further than they already have been um, and, and we can work with Amy and the other organizations to make the wording proper but if we can keep the ball rolling on this because we've lost a lot of um, the seasons here upon us Any other I public comment? It's, it's a revenue generator for the Yacht Club. So yeah. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. It's a revenue generator for the Yacht Club. Sure. Well, that would make sense. Yeah. Uh, speak for sure. Uh, Barry Griffith, Lane Engineering. I, I didn't even know about this amendment until just sitting here listening to this. Um, I'm just maybe offering a perspective as a planner and somebody who's had to draft and implement zoning codes. If, if I'm planning and zoning, I don't really want the headache of tracking and monitoring what's going on here. I think if I were you, I would base your decision on, do you think it is okay to have whatever number of RVs parked there on a temporary basis for use by members and guests or not? Leave it at that, and I think that simplifies the whole thing. You might want to put a time of year restriction, but Thinking you're ever going to understand who's coming and going, right. it's, it's just not going to happen. Where's Amy? That is the reality oh, okay. that we have to pretend. What do you think that of that? Reality is it there? I think that that I would prefer to talk with Jeff about that further. Uh, we have thought about a time of year restriction. But we're just not sure what the ultimate goal and use is for the yacht club. So we, that might not be wise to put a seasonal restriction on that use either. So I think that, so to the point as to why this is significant, 
is that RVs and campers are meant to be transitory, transient. They're not meant to stay in one place and they're not meant to be parked for weeks on end. They're not meant to become permanent structures. The county and counties all across the country have this experience that campers and RVs that are meant to be mobile and are meant to relocate after a certain number of days do not. And suddenly they also start to have sunroom additions and fixed patios that become um, second home space. So this is a, an issue that we're already dealing with um, in terms of compliance. So what we want to do is honor, and, and it's true that the Kent Island Yacht Club has been a, a good neighbor and has been a good partner in uh, dealing with this use and other uses on the property. So we want to do something that supports this need, but that doesn't create a situation where <clears throat> the county is in this position, excuse me, <coughs> with a formalized campground in a spot where that wasn't our intention. So there's a clear unintended consequence that we've seen occur and traditionally does occur with this type of use. And we know that that is not the intention with anyone who is sitting at the table and having this conversation. But land use doesn't really contemplate just one property owner, it contemplates land use over time. Okay, but, okay, but if, we, if we did it with the, with the four days, and the number of units that he's allowed, that should, as Barry suggested, that should alleviate all the issues. I don't think RV parking lends itself to a sunroom. Uh, it, it does if it stays yeah, there for so a year. Certainly well, does. <laughs> I don't think parking means you know, planning it. I, well, that's, well, that's I, been the okay. issue, it's been a problem. Yeah. I mean, you're right, you wouldn't think so. As an RV owner and going to a number of campgrounds, I can tell you that I haven't been to one yet where there isn't one that's been parked there indefinitely. And in fact, a number of them are permanent homes. They may not have stuff around them, but. And you're not gonna have permanent sewage, you're not gonna have permanent water. These folks that live in them full time, we were one in Knoxville, Tennessee uh, last year. And I won't say half, but at least a third were permanent residents. And, and I know that isn't your intention. And I think that the language that you've worked on and submitted is sufficient. It's just this one issue of being able to quantify this <coughs> consecutive use and what does that mean and how does it as it's written, there's no way of enforcing if that use is constantly consecutive. And you would work with me on that wording before we get before the county? Yeah, definitely, we would yeah. sit down and brainstorm. We were all brainstorming ideas that were consistent with the code already, and that's why we were evoking, invoking the language from special events and temporary uses. Um, but I think that took us down a rabbit hole. So we could do it with conditional. And when there is a text amendment that we all know is only going to affect one property, I used to call it something, but I got accused of being politically incorrect when I called it what it's known as. Uh, we have to pretend that the text amendment has nothing to do with the property. I understand. Any other com public comment? Public comments closed. Okay, Art. Okay, now I'm going to take a stab at this, and I'm not sure that, you know, it's okay. making my brain hurt. Um, <laughs> okay, proposed text amendment. I believe that's the part I'm reading, you know, for the amendment. County ordinance to chapter 18, 1 2016. So it's the Page recommend two of nine. 
No, page eight of eight nine. Eight of nine. A recommendation. Gotcha. The recommendation, based on the information, uh, you want me to take a stab at this? You take a stab at this because I'm looking at what you're saying. I was going to do the where the bold text amendment is. Go ahead, Jeff. No, I understand. Um, so, based off the information provided above in the Ken Allen Yacht Club Citizen Sponsored Text Amendment number 22-02 for overnight recreational parking associated with fraternal organizations in the Waterfront Village Center District, I hereby recommend a favorable recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners with the suggested language that it be considered and discussed to ensure consistency with 18-1-221 and Section 4-204 of the Land Use Articles with the following amendments. Number 5A, to change the language or remove as part of to change the language to on loan on land owned by and D to read or correction to add a period after organization and strike and or engaged with on site activity. And the last amendment would be for uh, Amy and her team to work with Mr. Smith to clearly identify the language or consistency of, what's the word, consecutive. Thanks. Eight, yeah, consecutive days. Second. But wait a minute, don't you need to put in? No, because it's just a recommendation for to move it to the. Uh, to the county commissioners. But you're not putting in about the fraternal organization or the overnight parking or the. I, so, yeah, to, we're accepting those with them to accept. Is that what? clear to you, Sharon? Pretty much. So we're accepting the the. The Kent Narrows comments is that the, was the, the, the Kent Narrows to? comments with the following amendments to change to uh, landowner and then. Uh, add a period after organization and strike through and or engaged in an on-site activity. Is there a second? I second the. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So moved. Thank you very much. <laughs> a learning experience. <laughs> Hook the bars up never a dog. It's all well intentioned. We'll see what it looks like when it's done. Now we are on the citizen sponsored text amendment, Taco twenty two oh three, Barry Waterman. And Stephanie, you want to give us Yep a review? So the, the intent of this uh, citizen sponsored text amendment is to remove the woodlands protection standards that are in the resource protection standards um, found in the code. Um, this is a, another layer. Um, you have forest conservation outside of the critical area, then you have critical area obviously requirements inside the critical area. The woodlands provisions are also an additional requirement on top of those. 
Um, so it's, it's an, almost an overlay of those requirements as well. Um, the resource protection standards, um, other uh, resource protection standards include steep slopes, streams and stream buffers, wetlands, um, erosion hazard areas, shore buffers. So those are a couple of the other uh, resource protection standards that are outlined um, in the code. Um, and due to these overlay kind of requirements, there is a little bit of a complexity, you could say, with between the requirements that come from the state with critical area and forest conservation, and then the woodlands provisions that come from, from the county specifically. Um, the woodlands provisions do offer greater protection of woodlands than what um, forest conservation and critical area does. So there will be, um, potentially could be greater tree removal woodlands removal with the um, removal of the woodlands provisions. Um, there are, um, currently there is an avenue to, it's not a variance, but it is an avenue that an applicant could take. It's to use uh, transfer development rights in order to, to increase the amount of woodlands that they can remove. It's not used very often, um, but it is an option to utilize for that process. Um, and then holistically, we've kind of looked at through the comp plan process, these re resource protection standards, they all need looked at. Um, some of them might need removed, um, others might need added. So it is kind of like a whole um, holistic kind of look at because it does affect the entire county. It's not just specifically one zoning district. Um, and it does, like I said, you are impacting how critical area forest conservation, they are specifically state regulations, both of them. Woodlands is specifically the county um, requirements. Um, also, the 2022 comp plan that was just adopted, adopted does establish a, a no net loss of forest. Um, there is an intent in there for that. Um, but overarchingly, um, there could be a greater tree loss or tree removal of woodlands if the woodlands protection is, is removed. So um, because of the fact that, like I said, we needed to look at all the resource protections um, and with the update, of, since we finished the comp plan process, the next process is to go through the zoning code. Um, and because of that, um, staff is inclined just to give, not give a favorable recommendation um, because we would look at it more of a holistic view with the update of the zoning code when that occurs. Um, if you have any questions. Okay, but you're, you're updating the zoning code. You have to do that anyway, right? And this would just be a portion. It would a be a portion. Of the pie. Be, yeah, a piece, a piece of, of that the pie. when we go through that process. Yeah. Okay. Is that it, Steph? Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. The, the quickest way I can get through um, an Who explanation are you? of Who why. Are you? Oh, Barry Waterman, Centerville, Maryland. Um, Thank you all for hearing this. Um, the quickest way I could get through this is to uh, run you through a quick PowerPoint. Um, okay. I, I don't know how can we plug that in over yeah, there. I, can, I think I can. I think I can. Well, while she's doing that, I will um, offer that uh, while I submitted this application, uh, Barry Griffith is the co-driver of this bus. Uh, he's in, um, he has some significant concerns about this, and he can bring a lot more. Um, background information to this. Uh, I don't hold myself out there to be an expert in land use or an engineer, but I am uh, certainly uh, not a neophyte in how Queen Anne's County regulations impact Queen Anne's County properties. And that's, um, that's what I want to show you through this PowerPoint is my understanding of how these laws interact with each other. And my presentation is not likely to um, to be very different from what Stephanie told you in terms of the need to update things. Uh, some of, the, some of the, the confusion and problems between the various ordinances are why this particular um, issue is, is more problematic. Um, okay. Did you want Barry to talk now or at the end? Um, I think it would be easier if I went to the PowerPoint if it's ready shortly. Okay. Um, it will be. <laughs> One second. It'd probably be faster if I can just sit over there yep. and quick do it. Or I can turn the... Either way. That's perfect. Sorry. <laughs> Technical difficulties? You want to take a five-minute break? Oh, no, it's only going to take about ten more seconds. Nine, eight, 
Seven. Oh my gosh. Six, oh my gosh. Five. She's going fast. Yeah, you went I fast. I wasn't going to go that fast. Why is it not seen? I lied. I definitely lied to you. I blame uh, Queens County IT, not Queens County Television. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Okay. Okay. So that's the uh, that's the text that's in question. Um, I'm not going to I'm not going to read that to you. But before I start, I think it's important to note that the current staff is not to blame for the issues that I'm going to bring up. Um, this predates everyone except the possibility Mr. Drummond may have been a young whippersnapper of an attorney when, when this was created. Um, it's a holdover from when Queen Anne County's planning director thought that we could trump the efforts to impose critical area regulations on Queen Anne's County by having different regulations that were better. We can't, bl we can't even blame Joe Stevens on that. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, zoning's complicated stuff, and everything relates to everything else. Um, updates to sections come sporadically and at different times, and sometimes a mess results. Um, there's two major problems with this particular provision. The first, that it's practically and legally confusing. And the second, it imposes restrictions on Queen Anne's County residents that are stricter than the rest of the state. It's confusing. It regulates woodlands inside and outside the critical area, but woodlands don't exist in the critical area. What exists is based on what's defined in the regulations. Forest and developed woodlands exist in the critical area. 18-1 defines woodlands but not forest or developed woodlands. Critical Area Act defines forest and developed woodlands uh, but not woodlands. And the Forest Conservation Act describes other ones. So it's not as simple as you might think. All those things talk about, you know, sound like trees, but it's not that simple. If they were all synonymous, it wouldn't be confusion. But each one's defined differently in each code. So there's a definition in chapter 18, a continuous area of natural vegetation predominantly containing trees and other woody plants, a tree is not a, a single tree is not a woodland. That is clear as mud in terms of what is what. Um, <coughs> this is the forest, uh, I mean, the uh, Critical Area Act. The highlighting is mine to show you that in the Critical Area Act, if it's um, less than an acre, it doesn't fit into the de definition. Um, for either woodland or developed woodland. If in the uh, uh, Forest Conservation Act, if it's less than 10,000 square feet, it doesn't fit that. Um, at least in B1, there is a definition of a forest that you might <coughs> be able to follow what it means. So what's a forest? What's dominated mean? What's predominantly mean? I don't know. I mean, I use the zoning code in my business all the time. I don't know what those terms mean. Um, what if the woody plants are invasives? Um, those questions are often um, more impactful on small lots than they are on large ones. So we look at a picture here. Is this a forest, woodland, or developed woodland? I, I don't know that any of us could answer that question. Uh, I think that we could only say that it's one of those three. But here's a, here's a more problematic. Is this a forest or a developed woodland, or is this something else? There's roughly 20 trees on this half-acre lot with a full canopy. But there's 150 million blades of grass underneath of it, um, according to Google, the expert on how many grass plants there are on an acre. There's no woody plants other than trees. Is this predominantly or, or, or uh, dominantly covered by trees, or is it predominantly or dominantly covered by grass? Is it a forest? Is it a woodland? Or is it a lawn? Who decides? And how, what basis did he use to decide that under any of our codes? This is a more typical example. This is a lot down in Romacook. The question is, is it a forest, a woodland, or a developed woodland? The undergrowth is uh, tall grass and phragmites, which outnumber the trees a million to one on that site. Note the neighbors don't have very many trees on the right-hand side. The fact is, if you build a new home on this and you limit yourself to the tree clear and it's allowed, the new owners uh, often want their lot to look like the lot next door where they have a nice yard where the kids can play. And the, 
there's questionable enforcement against owners. When, when you apply for a building permit, it's in front of the planning department and they get to enforce the regulations. But once somebody moves in and they cut the trees down, who's going to know? Who's going to enforce that? So the question is, is there really a long-term good by leaving uh, 166 in the code? And can we have equitable enforcement or is it always going to be inequitable? This is a picture. In the background, there are five houses that I built. There are trees within 20 feet of each one of those houses, 100 foot tall trees within 100 feet, because that's how many trees we could clear based on the re um, regulations. Yet in the foreground is a house that's been there for 20 years who apparently decided they didn't like trees and wiped out all the trees in the backyard. Um, I will tell you that there is a significant number of new homeowners in those communities, just because that's where there's new homes that have been built under these regulations, that go in and take the trees out afterwards. So the fact is, when you drive through most of these older communities that have small lots, more of them look like the foreground than the background, because more of them are existing houses that have people living in them than new ones. Um, Chapter 14 defines uh, woodlands as more than an acre in size, yet there are protections for trees regardless of parcel size. If you're in a critical area and you do something, with, you want to take a tree down, you've got to get a permit, you've got to pay mitigation, or you've got to replace it. Um, but there's no protection for forest or developed woodlands if it's under, under one acre in the Critical Area Act. Uh, forest conservation specifically exempts parcels that are 40,000 square feet or smaller from its regulations. Exempts all land governed by the critical area, just defers to the critical areas being more res, uh, restrictive and therefore only use those. Um, exempts clearing of up to 40,000 square feet on any size parcel. And exempts up to 40,000 square feet of clearing for any minor or minor site plan. Uh, 18166 trumps all of these. The question is why? What, what are we gaining by that? Everybody in the state of Maryland had to adopt critical area and forest conservation regulations that meet the minimum state standards. State approves those regulations. Um, we already have the critical area and the Forest Conservation Act that protects trees, woodlands, woodlands, or whatever you want to call a group of trees and scrub, wherever they might be. So in my mind, 18166 is not necessary. Um, and it's particularly troublesome, on, for me at least, I found it to be particularly more troublesome on smaller lots than lots of record. If you're doing a larger project and you want to exceed the uh, criteria for clearing, um, as planning told you, you could use a TDR in theory to do that. We're in the process of doing that now on a larger project, but that doesn't really work for a quarter acre lot somewhere. Um, That's predominantly white. <laughs> <laughs> okay, to my knowledge, this is the only place in, the, in Chapter 18 that attempts to impose specific critical area regulations on lands not being subdivided. It just seems like it's in the wrong place to be there at all. Um, everywhere in our code, small lots are treated differently than large lots. Lot coverage depends on the lot size. The smaller the lot, the higher percentage you get of lot coverage. Setbacks are reduced on smaller non-conforming lots, and the forest conservation exempts parcels that are 40,000 square feet or smaller. Uh, this is a hypothetical example of an uh, urban commercial parcel in an LDA inside a growth area. Um, every tree under the Critical Area Act that you take out has to be mitigated for. Um, if it's not in a critical area, the forest conservation wouldn't apply because it's under 40,000 square feet. But when you apply 1066, you're limited to 20% of the woodlands on that half acre lot is the most that you can take out. If you use in a square footage basis uh, as opposed to a per tree basis, that half acre lot can have 4,300 square feet cleared for a building, sidewalks, uh, stormwater, and, and uh, parking. It's just not enough, uh, even a warehouse which is the minimal parking requirement that you have under our code, you probably couldn't even fit a thousand square foot building um, on that parcel. It's just not a logical use of urban, urban, urban commercial property in a growth area. Um, here's a half acre wooded lot in Canal Estates. Um, 
you could interpret some of the regulations to say it can't be woods, uh, develop woodlands or woods because it's under one acre. Uh, does, is the proper interpretation that the area of woods should be under one acre or that the area of the property should be under one acre is unanswered in our code. Uh, if it's in a critical area, every tree you remove uh, with or without a permit, you have to mitigate for, and if you do it without a permit, then you have to mitigate at four to one when you're discovered. Uh, if it's not in a critical area, the forest conservation would say that it doesn't apply because it's less than 40,000 square feet. But when you apply 166, you limit it to 20% of the woodlands that can be cleared, 40% if it's outside the critical area. So the total clearing, if the lot's inside the critical area, is 2,000 square feet, you can't do anything there. And the total clearing outside is 4,000 square feet. Now, the staff has worked um, with Critical Area Commission and whoever else is involved to come up with a workaround to make it possible to build on these lots that have existed for 100 years, uh, and that's commendable. Um, but the question is, um, we don't need that workaround if 1-66 didn't exist. Um, if there was a long-term gain by leaving it in place, that would be one thing. But the fact is that those trees get taken down by new owners over time, those trees, a lot of those trees are, uh, you all been down through Ken Island States and Romacoke, most of the woods down there is scrub, junky trees. It was a farm, I don't know, 70, 80 years ago. Um, they're they're uh, hydric soils down there, so these trees are not deeply rooted. When you come in and you carve out an area for a house, all the trees around it are gonna be weakened by that. So having to keep 60% um, of the trees on a site um, is problematic from a lot of perspectives, uh, safety of the house, um, utility of the lot compared to the existing houses that are there that have already taken them out. So uh, my summation is that uh, we should simply eliminate this and let staff do all of the cleaning up of the contradictions in all the resource protection codes as they go. That is not a simple task that they're going to take care of next week if they start next week. I mean, it's years of effort to bring everything into alignment, which is why I think we should eliminate this now as opposed to waiting to do it more comprehensively in the future. Um, it's confusing and it's contradictory. Uh, it places much greater restrictions. It is true that if you eliminate this, there may be more trees removed on certain properties than others. Uh, when we were going through the comp plan, uh, I, I testified a warning about unintended consequences of no net loss policies. It's in there, I understand that, but a no net loss policy should not be thought of or applied to any individual property. It should be thought of from a county-wide perspective. So we, if we have a no net loss policy, it would be virtually impossible to apply that to a quarter acre wooded lot in Ken Island Estates that's been a lot of record and people have been paying taxes for um, as, a, as a building site for forever. Uh, but it, it is possible on a county-wide basis, and, and quite honestly, there's, there's a significant percentage of the development that has taken place in Queen Anne's County that is added to the woodlands in Queen Anne's County. Um, so this eliminating this is not the uh, equivalent of saying we can't get to a no net loss. It's, it's just the reality that the die has been cast on some of these older, smaller properties. And for those to be able to be developed, this is, is significantly um, problematic. It devalues those properties and it uh, reduces their utility to the owners. It has, honestly, it has been mostly forgotten or ignored on lots under 40,000 square feet for the last 30 years. Um, because the Forest Conservation Act um, said it didn't apply and the, I, I can only assume that the county uh, at the time took a position that it simply shouldn't apply. Somewhere that changed. It happened in the last five or six years and I say that because when I started clearing lots in Ken Island States, we cleared the lots in Ken Island States and no one had any issue. Uh, permits knew that we were going to clear the whole lot and then somewhere along the line that changed and we had to go through um, uh, implementing this. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, that's just the reality um, that, and, and the, the biggest issue is that I just don't believe it's accomplishing a long-term good, um, particularly on smaller lots. Okay, and Barry? <clears throat> Uh, 
Barry Griffith Lane Engineering. Um, if Barry didn't confuse you, um, I don't know what, what would. Um, it's, it's been confusing to me in my 22 years working representing property owners on development projects, and it was confusing my six years when I worked for the county trying to implement the zoning codes and when I was reviewing development projects. Um, and this is, this is not a new issue. So as, as Stephanie indicated, in 87, we were an innovative county. We were one of the only counties that had in our zoning ordinance tree protection measures. Very soon after that, uh, later in the 80s, um, critical area law came in. And critical area law preempted and took over all regulation of any kind of woodland clearing and uh, protection within the critical area. And then a couple, few years after that, the Forest Conservation Act came in and it took over everything else, everything that wasn't the critical area. Those two sets of regulations, while not specifically no net loss, both have provisions that are much more comprehensive in terms of how they protect and create new forests than 18166 ever is. All 18166 is, it says you can only clear so much based on your zoning, uh, based on uh, whether you're in critical area or not, so there's overlap with the critical area rules as Barry indicated, but they, they're not a no net loss type set of regulations. They just put a, a number limit on it. And it, it contradicts and it conflicts with these two overarching state mandated regulations that now apply everywhere else throughout the state. Um, the thing that's better about Forest Conservation Act and critical area are that, you know, you do have to balance out how much you can clear with requirements for planting. So they actually get further towards no net loss than just a, an ordinance that says you can only clear so much. Uh, forest conservation outside of the critical area, you've got, uh, you've got to be prepared by quali qualified professionals. Uh, there's a very detailed formula that has a break-even point. You can clear so much without having to do any mitigation, but if you clear more than that, then you have to do mitigation, which means planting forests or paying fees and lose. Critical area law is, is really a no-net loss. You take a tree out, you replace it. Uh, you take out a little bit more, you replace it two to one. And now you have to also pretty much aforest your buffer every time you develop a critical area property. So we have a lot of actual woodland uh, and aforestation being created in the critical area. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, many years ago I worked for Tom, your family, we did a subdivision on the water and you recall there was a significant amount of planting that had to happen a field that had to be turned into a forest. I mean, that's how critical area works. And so, you know, I would just say that we recognized this even back when I worked for the county um, in the late 1990s, when we set up the growth areas and we put in those master plan residential uh, districts, CMPD, SMPD, we specifically excluded 18166 from those, those, those districts all for the reasons that I'm talking about now. We already have Forest Conservation Act. We've already got a critical area. We don't need a contradictory and conflicting set of regulations in place for woodlands in an area where we're trying to encourage development to occur within our growth areas. So we've already taken the step of eliminating 18166 in certain locations, and it's been my position, and I brought this up to prior, uh, prior administrations in the planning department, that you know, it's time for this sort of redundant, overlapping set of rules and regulations just to go away. We had other resource protection standards in the 87 ordinance that have gone away as a result of the fact that critical area laws did come into place. This is a, this is a holdover that probably should have went away a long time ago, and it would have been a lot easier for the county to deal with if it had. So those are my comments. I, I know Tom Aid. Um, uh, there's a developer uh, who's going to participate from Zoom who wants to give you a specific example of how this conflict 
uh, uh, affected their property. We have to do it in less than three minutes. Yep. <laughs> Amy, can you shed some light on, on how difficult it would be just to eliminate that 18.1? Not difficult. It, that's what's being proposed. I mean, does it cause you heartburn overnight or what? Almost everything that has been presented to you is accurate. It is confusing. Um, when so certain... this is just a housekeeping item? Pretty much we're just going to do some housekeeping and throw it out in the trash? <laughs> we recommend that they throw it out? We have been in the process of updating Chapter 14-1, which is the critical area program, for quite a while. But we will be earnestly uh, updating that chapter ahead of the update to the whole zoning code. And in doing so, we were already going to look at the woodland protection provisions as well as the 300-foot shore buffer. So the short answer is, Yes, it could be managed as a quick housekeeping item right now, and then we will come along behind it and sweep a little more thoroughly. Okay. Because it is confusing, very confusing. Okay. That right. is not misrepresented. <laughs> All right, you answered the question. Okay, Co public comment. Okay, you got, wait a minute, you got somebody up here. What? Oh, he's the public comment. You want him to have three? I'm sorry? You want three minutes on the clock? Yep. Yes, sir. You want to introduce yourself? Whoops. Whoops. Uh -oh. you, you have to turn your sound on. Where's where he is? He's not. No. <laughs> uh, we can try to fix this and come back to talk with someone else. Okay. Uh, Mr. Falstead. Good morning, Commissioners. Jay Falstead, Queen Anne's Conservation Association. Um, I guess I just have to say, if there wasn't confusion before, there is a lot of confusion now. Um, but taking into account the important need to protect and preserve our natural resources, especially concerning tree removal and especially in light of climate change. And because this would potentially apply to the entire county, we urge that you accept staff recommendations and vote favorably, uh, unfavorably on 2203. If you find that you cannot reject 20, 2203 outright, we urge that you accept staff recommendations by reviewing this text amendment through an update of the county zoning code. And it seems to me in light of what Amy just said, that's really the only practical way to move forward. So for right now, we re recommend that you vote unfavorably on this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any other public, public comment? Uh, we, we were able to fix the issue. It was a parks and rec issue, not a QATTV issue. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tom? Are you guys, guys able to hear we hear you, Tom. Thank you, Tommy. Is Creek Housing. Um, I'm the developer of the village of Slippery Hill. Um, I just wanted to share the constraints that have been placed uh, and the loss of the ability to add more affordable housing and workforce housing to our development. Uh, we had a 24 acre site, of which 23 acres approximately were forested. Um, the code uh, that we're discussing today uh, only allows us to clear 9.4 acres. Uh, which was more onerous than the Forest Conservation Act, which required um, that we were allowed that we could clear 14.7 acres. Um, as we found, uh, this is 5.3 acres of additional uh, area that could have been cleared in the growth area. Um, when we went through the planning process, we spent a lot of time redesigning the uh, layout. Then, um, largely to focus on active recreation areas and limiting the number of, uh, in, the, in our particular case, the, the senior building, uh, our senior affordable housing building was reduced in size because of the constraints. 
and desires of the green space. Um, if we look just simply at the um, density elements as it, as it relates to the development that we're developing now and where we could have been, um, there was a loss of 86 units uh, of workforce housing um, that were unable to be built as a result of uh, the restrictions on clearing from the act. And I'll just note that, that um, the level of development with uh, the GGMC zoning uh, Constricted or restricted further by the this ordinance uh, conflicted entirely with what the, uh, the ideas were that were presented in the Grace and Community Plan for the area. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? I would say good afternoon, but it's not afternoon yet. David Azar, I live in Chester. So, um, Confusing? Absolutely. I bought a, an acre lot next door to my primary residence years and years ago <clears throat> so that I'm currently under construction building a new house for my wife and I to move into. Purchased the lot with um, Barry's father's help back in the day and since then trees grew wild. I made the mistake of asking Barry's advice on the critical areas and this and that and what he just said in this room, he said basically to me on a phone call and I almost dropped the phone because I couldn't understand what he was saying. I had to hire Tom Davis to go just to get a permit to build a single family home on a house that <coughs> I should have cut the trees down years ago or not let them grow and be bigger. There was nowhere to put a house. So all I wanted to say is I'm in favor of this text amendment because you can't, I mean, whether you're a developer, build one house for yourself or build big projects, you can't even understand this stuff as we've witnessed today. Thank you. Uh -huh. Any other public comment? We do have uh, one email to read. Okay. Uh, this email came in from the Shore River Keepers, more specifically uh, Al Bassett and Annie Richards. Thank you for the opportunity to submit comments on the citizen sponsored text amendment application 2203. Shore Rivers is a local nonprofit dedicated to the protection and restoration of Eastern Shore waterways, including Queen Anne's County's Chester and Y River and Eastern Bay and its tributaries through science based advocacy, restoration and education. Text Amendment 2203 would repeal the Woodlands Provision 181-66, which specifies woodland disturbance limits that are not subject to the Critical Area Law and Forest Conservation Act. Considering the environmental impacts and the resulting potential loss of forest, Shore Rivers does not support this amendment application. Conserving and protecting woodlands were identified within the county's vision in the recently drafted 2021 Comprehensive Plan Chapter 5, Environmental Resources. The purpose of the Woodlands Provision is to ensure the high quality forested areas are retained while also ensuring that forest resources are considered early in the design phase of development projects. The provision does not prevent development but instead ensures consideration of the environmental resources that benefit our county's economy, surrounding waterways, climate resilience, and the way of life in Queen Anne's County. The citizen application submitted by Mr. Waterman states that the Woodland Provision is confusing and results in erratic enforcement and convoluted, convoluted workarounds. Shore Rivers does not want erratic enforcement nor convoluted workarounds and therefore encourages the county to work with Mr. Waterman to further clarify the language in the Woodland Provision to avoid any future confusion as opposed to completely removing the provision. It is common for local provisions and state regulations to have differences, especially when local governments are required to implement those provisions locally. In such instances, the more restricted provisions usually apply, such as 181-66 outside of critical area. The Woodlands provision supports Queens County's vision of conserving and protecting woodlands and does not prevent all development nor contradict critical area or Forest Conservation Act regulations. For this reason and reasons mentioned above, Shore Rivers urges the Commission to give an unfavorable report on Text Amendment 2203. Thank you. And that's all I have. Any other public comment? Yes, sir. I am Bruce Orr. I'm with La Crosse Homes, a developer and builder in the Canal area. 
Um, I think the, the point being made here is really about tree conservation. And if the, you know, as a developer, we are required to build per the permit and to get a permit. So it's really after the fact of when we complete our job and the per purchaser owns the home, what compliance are they um, looking at? And, and as we have seen from the presentation, that a lot of the tree removal is happening after the, the projects are complete. So I think if we're focusing on areas of, of conservation, we may look at some sort of enforcement or how do we look at what happens once the homeowners have, have moved into the residence. Any other public comment? I truly believe that this is a housekeeping item and you're going to do it anyway. Um, and why not help the builders out today rather than wait for a year? At least. Right. At least. A year or two or three. So um, let's have a, a proposal. I'd like to offer up some advice, Madam Chair. First of all, I think, sure. uh, with all due respect to Mr. Griffith and Mr. Waterman, uh, that this is regressive. I think it's a good thing, a good position, that the county is more restrictive than the state. Uh, I wholeheartedly agree it's confusing and onerous, um, to the point that I'd like to tap the brakes, if you will, and allow the county staff, Amy and her team, who have so proficiently got us through this comprehensive plan rewrite to surgically go in and clarify and rectify their concerns as best available to their availability and not throw the baby out with the bathwater uh, by taking a broad stroke and removing natural resource protection that this county has prided itself on for years and simply take the default posture of critical area will fix this and it covers this because I don't have a whole lot of faith in that system at all. Um, I think it would be more careful approach, a more respectful approach uh, to the work that has gone in to put this in place in the first place. Um, and that it's okay that we can't clear full lots. That was the intent of this in the first place. However, there are workarounds. There are provisions, TDRs, other opportunities for the development community to come in and appropriately follow the rules of the road and just let's be careful and not just strike an entire um, section from the code uh, that is more restrictive and more protective our, of our valued resources that we all hold so dear and all the co-benefits that go along with this sea level rise uh, global global warming climate change carbon sequestration that all these trees provide habitat resource uh, there's a reason that mr uh, aid was not allowed to clear that entire building envelope in the Grayson bill. It's because it's contiguous with other properties. It has other co-benefits that far exceed what would be mitigated if that were allowed to go through in, in its, in its uh, the desire of the developer. Um, I don't think it's terribly restrictive of development. It certainly is more protective and it should be in my eyes. Uh, and I'm certainly willing and helpful, hopeful uh, that development community and the department can see through this confusion and instead of, of wholeheartedly throwing things away uh, at, the, at the suggestion that it's the easier housekeeping approach to take, uh, let's instead take our time and do it right and, and keep in mind all these other benefits that we've tout and heard about in other projects uh, that we should be protecting these rural landscapes and uh, not turning you know, a blind eye to all the benefits that are uh, what we enjoy and are ridiculously hard and expensive to put back in place through mitigation period with all due respect um, I think that this wording was is confusing and contradictory as you have admitted um, but it was only a housekeeping item and it's not throwing the baby out with the water it's cleaning up a mess that was made in the 80s right but that's the staff recommendation period. The staff recommendation is Sta staff to is go through like and take care of this to in a, a respectful different, way. And staff has waffled into a different direction. They've, they've also agreed that this was going to go away when they sit down with it. I don't believe that was the intent that I heard for this to go away. Um, I think it's going to be deleted when they, when they redo it. 
they well, said if, if we that's the case then then i'd like to take that path we're just doing than, the right we're just doing the, the I'm, I'm happy to disagree with you and i respectfully do so okay. uh, but i then i would, agree I would prefer the process to see its way through rather than simply strike the code uh, because it, it's it's, it's perhaps just a, less painful. It's just a little no, it's just a little part of the code that shouldn't have been there in the first place. They have three ways that they, they have to um, fix it. They have to they have to comply three ways and they can't because there there's three different definitions of it. Sure, let's clean that up. Exactly. Let, let's clean it up. Do. Let's not throw out what's Beneficial. We're only throwing out this one little section. It, is, it has. It, it doesn't change the con conservation. It doesn't change the critical area. It doesn't change the forestation. It's only going to clean up the wording in this one little section. What do you say that, to the point in the staff report that recommends that it's uh, contradictory to the comprehensive plan that we just passed? Those two bullet points on page eight of eight. The last two on the How list. How does it contradict the comprehensive plan? I don't know that I said it was contradictory. I just noted that we um, would like to look at a no net loss. I mean, we do support, um, obviously, the other end of this is de development, obviously. We support that through the economic chapter, but also we do support our natural resources. There are um, strategies to support, um, I'm pretty sure, all the natural resources, not just woodlands. So it is, right. it's supportive in both, both ways, of course. Right. Madam Chairman, if I, if I might, um, I understand what, what Mr. Uh, Mr. Lee has, to, his opinion on that, and, and I, I agree with much of what he has to say. This is not a development issue. A developer on a larger project can deal with this as it sits today through use of a TDR. But to ask um, someone who wants to build on a quarter acre lot that has existed forever to go buy a TDR, which quite frankly, there aren't a whole lot of them sitting out there. The only reason that there's a developer now uh, proposing to use a TDR to deal with this is because I have a project where I had a problem and I have been sitting on a couple TDRs for 30 years waiting for a, a, a way to use them. And this was an option. Um, so a larger developer, this is not going to impact them. This is not going to, um, if it stayed the way it is, it, it, it really doesn't have any negative impact on things outside the growth area. This is most problematic for individual owners of small parcels inside growth areas. Um, and what if, what if the amendment was uh, that 66 applies only to parcels of land greater than an acre? Outside the growth area then that would be fine inside the growth i mean it just doesn't make sense to have a growth area is to in, is to encourage growth not to stop growth so you put growth in the growth area so that it doesn't go other places so i personally think that if you wanted to limit this to say uh 166 only applies outside the growth areas and it do, does not apply to lots less than one acre that solves the problem that i see well, this, um, this gets to my point about paint, painting with wide brushes. Let's, let's think this through carefully. And if there's a workaround, and I don't, that's a, I don't like to use that word, but if there's an opportunity if, if there's to be creative. Around, look, what's happened between critical area and the county down at Kent Island Estates, so-called workaround, Amy's not going to agree with me. But 66 was the problem, and they worked around it whether 66 is being complied with exactly in this so-called workaround. But I, I do have to uh, no, make you a wouldn't point. Like that. Well, but that isn't, that isn't accurate. That um, workaround was actually a plan that the county developed to address critical area, required critical area mitigation. And the county, uh, with the uh, coordination with Steve Cahoon, who has been managing the ski project um, as a part of the team managing the ski project, what the county had to do was account for that percentage of tree removal with a comprehensive mitigation plan off site. So that actually was a critical area uh, requirement and that was not a uh, chapter 18 um, 66 requirement. So I did want to clarify that point because uh, Barry had mentioned it earlier and that wasn't pertinent to 66. 
it, I, uh, I was around when this was done in the, in the 80s, and it was a Barry Perkel initiative to try to <clears throat> be more restrictive than it was expected that the critical area laws would be so that the critical area law would not apply in Queen Anne's County. That didn't work, obviously. <laughs> this is one of the two or three remnants of that effort that are still in the code. The 300 foot, four bu 300 foot shore buffer is another one that comes to mind immediately. Um, this has been talked about 66, 300 foot shore buffer. It, it's sort of, the, the, it's like this over the last 30 years. Let's get rid of it and then it sort of disappears. And let's get rid of it and it disappears. And this is definitely not something that I just dreamed up recently. I have approached both county commissioners and previous planning directors about this particular issue. Uh, it wasn't as big a deal because there weren't a whole lot of small lots that were buildable. There are a lot of small lots that are buildable today, so which is why this is more pressing. I did meet with Amy and Stephanie who, who asked me to withdraw this because they were going to address it, and I fully believe that they are going to address it, but I also believe it's going to take them three or four years to get through the process they need to get through. And if this is not accomplishing a long-term goal, why add it? Well, Tom A. did, did tell us that it did affect his property, uh, the Slippery Hill. And Tom Lee says, well, what's wrong with him being limited to, um, to 9.3 acres instead of 14 acres? That's a legitimate point. So, Well, he's in a growth area. He's got public sewer and water. Um, that's that's. I, I, I would kind of I kind of see Tom Lee's point. Maybe we should think about that more carefully. But if it's under an acre and outside the growth area, do we care? Does it make sense to get rid of it? Yes. Do with me. As a person who owns land outside the growth area. I'm a simple guy, just old farm boy, right? There's like four things that I believe in. Lower taxes, fewer regulations, smaller government, and more freedom. This is my land, right? So yes, I believe that one acre lot outside the growth area is just as important, if not more important, than the land that's inside the growth area. I'm I fully support, hearing what I've heard, deleting this regulation. To delete it or to, delete to it. enforce it? Delete it. It's not like you, you're all of a sudden entering a vacuum. With all due respect, there are still apparently copious regulations involved that, re that regulate the amount of trees mm -hmm. that are on properties. Delete it. Make it simple. Make it easier. I think he's done a compelling job of explaining what's going on with this regulation. I think it's incumbent upon us to look after the one acre lot owners who can now no longer maybe build on their lot, regardless of how few they are. It's everything to them. But don't you see the point, Mr. Sylvester, in going and, and removing that concern, that constraint that Mr. Drummond just brought up and Mr. Uh, Waterman agreed to, that if that one speed bump were removed, a great deal of their consternation would be missed. So that why throw out all of the rest of that protective measure that's in that language for the one relatively small minor correction that gets rid of the confusion that, that the development community has brought, or the applicant, I need to label them, uh, has brought to our attention. He's a developer. I don't think that's necessarily a perjurative term. I, you I know, don't think it I, is. I, you can use it. Um, I'm sorry. I just think that you have competing regulations that do nothing but muddy the water and make it difficult and expensive for people. And it's just a housekeeping um, I, I, It's not like they don't have an opportunity when they get to it to go back to this thing and make a new regulation 
that's more in line or that's more clear, that's easier for everybody to understand, whether it's a developer or whether it's a homeowner or whether it's just no farm. I don't disagree with you. My okay, so what we can beat this horse. Let's make a motion. You want to make a motion, Bill? I could try. Okay. All right, so. <laughs> um, this one's easy. Yeah, I think maybe so. So I think that we need to make a recommendation to the commissioners to uh, accept, uh, give a favorable recommendation to uh, the uh, text amendment 22-03 to delete section 18, uh, paragraphs 1 through 66 of the comprehensive plan in its entirety. Of woodlands in its entire, entire. I told y'all. Not the comprehensive struggle. plan. Pardon me? I think Not you the said comprehensive, comprehensive plan. plan, didn't you? I probably did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And woodlands. Woodlands. Okay. okay, can you just make, can we just make that then? Okay. Yes, sir. Can I get a second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. One. Okay. One very loud nay. So nay. <laughs> Thank you. We're taking a five minute break.
get back in session, please. All right, Taco 2205, Lisa Schrader. Uh, Stephanie, you're on. Yep. So Taco 2205, uh, the intent of this is um, to allow biconditional use major extraction in the no on a non-contiguous parcel of open space. Um, and this only occurs in the ag and non-critical area CS districts, so countryside districts. Um, the intent of a non-contiguous parcel is to pre preserve high-quality farmland um, that meets the soil's criteria. Um, that soil's criteria is consistent with mouth criteria um, in order to allow that, those development rights to be transferred to another parcel to be utilized for a subdivision um, and it be created at a greater density than what it would be allowed. Um, I provided in your packets um, a map that shows where all the non-contiguous parcels are located in the county, just so you can get an idea as, you know, as to where they are and the acreage that's out there. Um, so once that area is deemed open space, there's only a per permitted list of uses that are allowed in that area. Um, that area itself, uh, those permitted uses range from, you know, ag use all the way up to a, a commercial stable, um, also a shooting club, and a major, a minor extractions are permitted in the open space. So that would be five acres or less of an extraction um, are permitted currently in open space. What size is this lot? This, it's not a specific lot. This oh, would okay. be for any open space um, okay. parcel that's not contiguous. Okay. Um, so your major extraction sites, they usually consist of obviously an access to the site, your haul route, um, basically your scale house for, you know, where they weigh trucks in and out, um, screening obviously for the excavation, um, berms, and also obviously your um, stockpile area. So that's kind of an idea of what is involved in a major extraction. Um, like I said, they are um, obviously Miners are permitted, but they're less than five, five acres. Um, and then through the evolution of open space throughout the county, um, the list of permitted uses has kind of um, increased throughout the years. Um, we probably started maybe with about 10, and I think now we're probably up closer to like 15 maybe or so. I can't remember for certain, but there has been uses added over the years. Um, there are obviously, you know, the county does support that uh, mineral resources, we kind of went through that with the comp plan. We supported um, that through the county. It provides, you know, an economic benefit for the county. But um, basically this use, um, the, the intensity of it, um, staff is not um, giving a favorable recommendation just because it's not consistent with the intent of open space. So that's my, also Don Alanda Smith is here. Um, she administers the MOUTH program, so if you have questions, because I did note that the requirements are consistent with MOUTH, um, the, the soils criteria. What program is she with? She works with the MOUTH. Um, and uh, that's an acronym? Yes, Maryland Agricultural Land Preservation Foundation. Okay. There you go. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Much better. So. Okay. Yep. That's it. Um, Yes, sir. Good morning. Uh, Jeff Thompson, uh, Thompson and Richard, Centerville, Maryland. I'm here rep representing Mrs. Schrader. Uh, a common theme sort of running through the staff report seems to be the preservation of, of these soils and the fact that they're used for an agricultural purpose. But I initially would like to point out that if you look at the soil types, you'll see also that uh, many of the NCDs, I'm going to call them the non contiguous development rights, came from woodland. Um, as a matter of fact, when farmers would do pulls, they would pull it from the, the, the land that was least likely to park, for example, or woodland or the like. So although there is a soil requirement, it, it's not necessary that you use those soils, if you will. So for example, if you, if you look at the permitted uses, a number of the uses don't require the, the use of the soils. I mean, agricultural use alone you know, you can have poultry houses, you can have an equestrian center, cows, dairy, and or, or beef, you can have uh, swine. So there are uses that don't really require the use of the soil to be, um, to make it practical, if you will. Also, if you look at the definition of agriculture under the ordinance, it includes aquaculture, which is either fish or aquatic um, uses. So 
when they get to the end of the day, well, it's just a pond when you get done, we don't really have a use for a pond. There is an agricultural use for a pond, pond by definition um, under our ordinance. Uh, and it acknowledges, uh, the agri aquaculture definition acknowledges the fact that it can either come from a natural water course of, or from an excavated, um, you know, either, and why not, if you're gonna excavate, why not take the raw materials that benefit the county while you're in the process? All right, as we go down the chart, um, another concern I think is this, you know, after you go through the reclamation process, what use could be made that's consistent with those uses that are permitted in the non-contiguous open space areas. Uh, as I point out, you have the aquaculture, um, you also have the shooting clubs, and of course the water feature is always a benefit to a, to a shooting club. Uh, and then you have this outdoor recreation, and if you look at the definition of outdoor recreation, it includes you know, um, nature areas and wildlife sanctuaries. And I don't know if you've ever been there, I had occasion to visit the, the gravel pit that's in the vicinity of Y Mills, it's just down the road from the 7-Eleven, but when I went in there, it, it was amazing the, the habitat that was there, um, and primarily ducks. I've never, I've never seen anything like that, it, it was remarkable. And if you've ever seen one of the, the ponds that's created as a result of you know, the extraction, they're beautiful. I mean, the water is like none other you've seen. It's, it doesn't look like a farm pond. It's, it's not, certainly not a stormwater management pond. It's a beautiful resource. Uh, and another option for these landowners would be do some, just do something with the county. You know, public recreation is permitted, but the property has to be owned by the county and managed by the county. But who's to say? I mean, if a beautiful lake was created, why shouldn't we take advantage of that lake and put in the jogging and the and some of the other um, outdoor amenities that are permitted on, uh, on those types of properties. Uh, another continued use really not addressed in the ordinance, but as a practical matter, you know, it would be an irrigation source for, for the, the adjoining properties uh, without having to drill the, you know, the deep wells in order to get to the, um, to the aquifer that would be required to, uh, to generate that amount of, of water. Staff wrote a very complete report. Stephanie did a great job, and I'm going to, you know, some of these points, you know, I, I really want to uh, highlight. And as she's already pointed out, there, there has been an evolution in the Queen Anne's County zoning ordinance, and other uses <coughs> have been added. And I, you know, is it that while we're here? Is it that why we just went through this comprehensive plan update? You know, things change, the world changes. Um, and there's some been said about, you know, didn't the landowners that sold these non contiguous developer rights, you know, they got some remuneration for it, they should have anticipated this. You can't anticipate everything. I mean, can you, you can't anticipate what the commodities market's doing, you can't anticipate, you know, what Mother Nature's gonna do in any given year. And this is basically just another tool in the toolbox to help those that have, you know, that have transferred those development rights off of the property. Um, and I know it's, it's described in the report as being industrial nature of the use, but at the end of the day, it can be very nice. And it's no more or less offensive on a property that has non contiguous development rights removed than it is the farms around it that haven't. I mean, anyone that goes by is, isn't going to know whether it's ease or it's not ease. The use is pretty much the same in either event. And the recommendation does point out that there's, you know, there's really a benefit to be able to, you know, extract, extract these raw materials. Um, mineral deposits of sand and gravel found the county provide opportunities to support local and regional development and infrastructure needs while contributing to the local economy, all true. Uh, I, th I think Stephanie pointed out that, you know, in addition to you know, the zoning change, uh, all major extraction requires board zoning appeals approval, so you still have to go through that process. 
And we've got a definition, we've got environmental resources, you know, there are two environmental resources at play here. One is the, the mineral resource we're asking to extract, but then we're creating a water resource. And if we don't extract these minerals from here in Queen Anne's County, they're going to be extracted somewhere and they're gonna come from outside the county and they're going to be trucked in. Why would, shouldn't we get the economic benefit of that having locally as opposed to not locally? Then staff's made, you know, drawn the concern again about how, you know, if, if this were approved, what about what's next down the pike, for example? Is it going to be solar? And they gave a laundry list of uh, other possible uses that might be proposed. But again, that's why we're here. Uh, you know, take it or leave it, but down the road as, as things change in our world, you're, gonna, you're going to be approached for these amendments and, and it's up to you to decide whether they're, they're good for the county, not, got not good for the county, given the time that, times that we're in. Um, you know, the ordinance needs to change with, with changing times. Uh, again, another tool in the, in the toolbox. And unless you have questions, that's really, that's really where I am. Do we have any questions for Jeff? Okay. Fine. Thank you. Don't go too far. Because if someone sells off their residential development rights and gets compensated for them and then the market changes, would you support a, an amendment that would let them put houses back on the land that they did restricted? I'm sorry, if the, if the law were changed? Yeah. Would you support an amendment that would let houses that go back on open space because the market's changed, because someone didn't anticipate what the future may bring? Well, it, it, it changes. I mean, we, did, we didn't an anticipate a pandemic or a war and all the things we're faced with today. I don't know that economic or inflation right now, I don't know that the economic times could get so bad that the commissioners wouldn't consider doing whatever was necessary to make the county more viable. That was a politically correct way to answer that. <laughs> I always, I always get ex expect that out of it. <laughs> well, don't, don't property owners make decisions and then they're kind of but once well, you I, sell, once you sell, is it that what's happened here? As you, you've heard, they've added new uses as, as time's gone on. And, and Are any of them inconsistent with the original intent of the open space? I don't know. Well, don't what know I'm saying there was a lot of the end uses that could be made of the property post excavation are consistent. Oh, I understand that part. Yeah, I get that. Mr. Drummond, question. What if TDRs were used Jeff, sit down. for, for sit open down. space? <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't a minor or major extraction become a development of the land and then it would no longer become open space, in your opinion? Well, just generally speaking. Well, um, minor extraction is a conditional, is permitted, no, no, wait a minute. Yeah, it's five acres or less. We're not talking five acres or less. Okay. It certainly changes it from act to commercial. So ask me the question again. So if I use TDRs yeah. and applied them to a certain parcel, non-contiguous areas, wouldn't that if if I went and I if this amendment passed, wouldn't that be changing the use of an open space to a commercial? Okay, okay there's two TDRs and non-contiguous development are two different things. So are you asking me about a TDR sending parcel? That is where the TDRs, where the development rights have been sold off, and now that parcel, the sending parcel, has become open space. Yes. Okay. That's not proposed here. I understand. Um, it's just the non-contiguous parcel. The non -contiguous. Now, I'm, also, now right. I'm not sure what the difference is between a TDR sending parcel and a non-contiguous sending parcel, so to speak, not a sending parcel. I'm not sure why we would allow major extraction on a non-contiguous parcel that's open space, but not a TDR sending parcel, because they're basically the same things. Um, but the use, okay, while the excavation is underway, 
one could argue that the use is inconsistent with open space. The end use, though, as Jeff points out, probably is consistent with open space. It's a big pond. Thank you. Here we made clear it's only the, the sending parcel. Um, I'm going to watch my terminology because Stephanie, well, we don't call it Stephanie corrected me when I drafted. I use the term transfer parcel, which only That's applies for TDRs. to TDR, right? right. <laughs> so they get, you know, Stephanie was kind enough that we worked through that. But, but we're, not, we're not asking to, to permit it on the receiving parcel, obviously, only on the sending parcel. Why not? Why not propose it then for the TDR transfer or parcel? Because aren't they the same essentially as the non contiguous parcel? I was concerned about parcel? the critical area element, is what I was concerned Pardon about. Me? Critical area is what I was outside concerned about. Outside the critical area, let's say. TDR sending parcel outside the critical area isn't the same as, not sending, transfer or, excuse me, isn't it essentially the same as non contiguous sending parcel? Yeah, but the, the old TDR, so that, that's, you know. We don't have a map of them, but I know there's a lot of transfer or parcels. <laughs> These are just the non-contiguous parcels, but just the non, yeah. right. if we added the TDR sending transfer or parcels exclude, excuse me, we'd probably double that. If you're asking me if I would be opposed to that, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> you're not getting any argument. Not. not getting any argument from no, me. Okay. They're the same thing. Yeah. Uh, any other questions from the commissioners at this point? I'm just not sure I feel comfortable fully understanding the scope of this because, you know, this type of open space and transfer of development rights, Montgomery County did this early in the game 40, 45 years ago and let developers do higher density inside of the developed area and let the farmers keep it as farmland in the back. Ultimately, it concentrated the growth in, in certain areas. We're that's talking exactly, about, that's exactly what this does. And, and so the question here, you know, is what's that impact on the aggregate of Queen Anne's County? Uh, we're not Montgomery County, I mean, you know, so let's try and avoid that experience. So the question here is being comfortable with what the consequences are to more parts of the county. Um, we've heard, you know, how many other pieces of property would this be impacting as far as this is just a representation of dots? How many other pieces of property would this be impacting? And the, 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 the map will show you what parcels, I think it's 5,300 acres, if you look in the, you know, that's like red. And it, really, it would really open up 5,300 acres to the potential for major extraction. Right. And just so you know, major extraction is allowed in the uh, in other districts through a conditional use so it's not that it's not allowed anywhere else in the county just to clarify that it would, it would, i think i'm correct in saying it would open up the possibility of major extraction on 5300 acres where it's presently not allowed because it's open space chris is but, correct but of the 5300 acres out of a county that's 200 and some thousand acres right how many of those 5300 would likely be even considered a, a site for major extraction. Unknown until you... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's probably fairly small. Well, it? It is. The uh, sand deposits tend to be up in here. Northern end of the town. <coughs> well, take out there. Right, right up in here. <laughs> to continue that line of thought, Bill, what take out the fact that it's an extraction, right? This could potentially open uh, opportunities for our solar development or a radio tower, right? Uh, in spaces where it wasn't, that wasn't the intent of these county held easements that we're talking about, right? Well, and, 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 and that's all true, and, and, and you'll have to look house. as, you'll, ha you'll have to look at them as, as and if they ever come forward. I mean, solar is such a hot topic right now, I wouldn't be a bit surprised at some point in time if someone didn't approach you, but you can say yes or no at the time. They're changing the world. I mean, we can't anticipate what might be proposed. No, but you, you give up some of that when you sign an easement. And, and we're- The county holds that easement, right? You wouldn't be able to do this on a MET easement. 
but just yeah. cons or ESLC easement. Oh, uh, don't tell, don't talk too fast about solar on MET easements. That may be coming. <laughs> State control. So, but they're all different. You still have you still have MET with Eastern Shore. You still have Rural Legacy, um, Mouth. All of them have have different. All the soil types are the same. They all have different components with regard to what you can build on them. For example, Mouth. Family members can can build homes uh, only. You have uh, METs usually a negotiated easement. Uh, the one I was just working on last week. It's next to Gunston School. There's even provision that they can deed. They'll take it out for Gunston. You know what I mean? It's a negotiated easement. This one, this just prohibits it prohibits dwelling. Uh, I think it might be wise to call Dan Donna forward. She could talk to you about mouth a little bit. If you're talking about MET and all the other, you know, conservation uh, programs, yeah. it might be a good idea to get her uh, in, insight. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Donna Landa Smith. I work for the Soil Conservation Office. Um, first, I would like to say I know Lisa Schrader. She's a friend of mine. I'm not here on a personal note. I'm not in favor nor object to gravel pits on properties. I'm here as a county employee with land preservation. A um, couple of things. I was around when Nagatigua started, Chris, so I, I gotcha. Um, and the answer for the acreage for deed restricted open space and transfer of development rates is 13,422 acres. So TDRs are about 8,000 then? Correct. So as far as the overall acreage that this may impact, and yes, Jeff, I agree that if the request comes in for a text amendment for non-contiguous, you also have to entertain the idea that you could have a text amendment for deed restricted open space, or you may have a text amendment for transfer of development rights. So in total, you may have the availability of 21,648 acres within the county that you could receive a text amendment to do a use, whether it be commercial or other uses that are not listed currently in the code. And under MALF, which is Maryland Ag Land Preservation Foundation, major or minor extractions are not permitted. It's considered as a commercial use. Under Rural Legacy, which is the Department of Natural Resources program for land preservation, major or minor extractions are not permitted. When a person sells their development rights to either one of those programs, they receive funding from the state of Maryland to preserve their farms as a farm in perpetuity, no buying back, no changing, unless there's two exceptions, and that would be a condemnation for the state. We had one case in Baltimore County where a major highway had a bypass go through and the farm was condemned. Or, um, you know, some other eminent domain, that's the only exceptions. There um, was a provision in MALF years ago to be able to buy out of land preservation, a 24 year term, but you had to prove that agriculture was not a viable economic, um, uh, not viably economic in your area. So if you were located in the center of Baltimore City, you could probably prove that. There was three cases taken to court um, to buy out of the preservation and it actually went to the Supreme Court and all three were denied in the state of Maryland. So in the sense of um, preservation, when I began to work in land preservation almost 20 years ago, every year Queen Anne's County had to prove to the state we're what we were called a proactive land preservation county. We had to do what we called a certification. We had to meet certain criteria with the state saying we're putting in local money, we're preserving the land, we're active in keeping it as agricultural use, and I had to prove to Maryland Department of Planning that our county held easements were permanent, there were in perpetuity, and they could not change. And what that does, it says to the state, we as a county have our own private easements totaling 21,000 acres plus that we considered as permanent easements. And that helped us retain 80% of our ag transfer tax and were able to um, secure more funding for mouth. If that use comes into question or changes to a commercial use, 
Maryland Department of Planning more than likely will take our certification away from us, which means millions of dollars for land preservation. That's a concern because we've made great strides in the last 15 years of almost $75 million in funding for land preservation within the county. And if we take that certification away, we go from getting to keep 80% of our money down to 30%. That's a concern. Um, and I think Queen Anne's County has set a precedence within the state. We're the second in the state for the most preserved lands, which includes deed restricted open space, non-contiguous development and transfer development parcels. And when non-contiguous began, the caveat was that if you're going to intensely develop on a property here, that you got to preserve some land somewhere else and it doesn't cost the county any money. Developers paid a lot of money for those development rights to be able to intensely develop on a one particular parcel. And one of the biggest differences between TDRs and non-contiguous, you could buy one development right with TDRs. Non-contiguous, you had to buy five. You had to buy five at a time. And it had to meet the same soil criteria as mouth. And yes, woodland is being used, but there's also tillable land that was being used. It can't be swamp land, non-tidal wetlands. It's got to meet class one, class two, or class three soils, or group one and group two woodland. So it has to be prime agricultural soils. So that's, that's some of the unintended consequences. And as I said, I'm not opposed to gravel pits. I, le I live near six of them, and I'm okay with that. And it's nothing personal, but the preservation part of it, um, it may be a, it may come into question through Maryland Department of Planning of our county easements permanent or not. Okay. Thank so, you. Let me, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you're chairman. Go ahead. So, just so I'm clear on this, now th th we're talking about non-contiguous development properties that were preserved with that program. Yes, that's correct. And you're saying that if we say, okay, you can go ahead and do a major extraction, that it would put the rest of the funding in jeopardy for this county? That's correct, because you have to meet certain criteria of how many lands that you preserve within your county each year. And you have to basically prove to Maryland Department of Planning that your, your intent is to meet your comprehensive goal plans for lands being preserved and that they stay as agricultural use. In the eyes of MAUF and Rural Legacy, a gravel pit is considered as a commercial use. Okay, when the farmer sold his non-contiguous development rights, yes. was he contractually obligated to not dig on his property? Well, it, it, it's in the permitted uses as a conditional use. So we've as established far as that he has land. a right to dig. And minor extraction, a minor, yeah. Five acres or less. And when, well, okay, but we've still established a right to dig, whether it's a small right, hole or a big right, hole. It's just like trying to, well, I won't go into that old joke. And one um, of the reasons why it was a minor extraction were created as a five acre was because many, many, many years ago, when people were digging irrigation ponds mm -hmm. or irrigation, that wasn't classified as a extraction site. And a borough pit. But what is okay? What is the difference between an irrigation pond and a major extraction pond, other than the depth of the water? You're not going to plant corn in either one. Removing not, material, I would assume. Yeah, but but from a practical standpoint, so what? It's still just a pond. Yes. Major extraction basically is and the, I, the and difference I still between get back the to my, my original question, though. But when the when the farmer sold his development rights. Yes. Through that TDR and program. And he got money for it. And he got money for it. But in that contract, he signed a contract, right? Saying that this is done. I know in perpetuity, I can't touch it anymore. What did it say? Did it say he can't plant houses? Or did it say he can't dig holes? Both. Both? <laughs> Except for a minor extraction that is that may be I mean, it's made. specific in that contract. I don't know. I'm, I'm, there's, there's, there's a, a list of space covenants you're talking about. There's a list of uses that are permitted in the code. Once so it's law. deemed so open So you're saying space. by contract, but by law, 
you agreed that you were going under that program. Well, I, I think if if it's in the contract, whether you know, it's it's got to be mentioned in the contract somewhere, doesn't it? That you it, no longer it might because be up, you're getting on money. The on the you're getting money for for a, 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 a kind of a vague thing. It's a you private know, contract. Right. The contract really so is between buyer and seller. It's a private transaction. Uh, it's I'm, a private. Yeah, it's yeah. a private contract. Okay. Yeah, it's the it's the but you're doing it under code provisions that limited what you could do. And that's specified. I'm not sure was the code provisions on those um, plats that were recorded. I don't know because you have to record a subdivision plat. I mean, you understand where I'm coming from. Yes, if, I understand if a farmer that. Does not have the idea. He may not see in the future far enough to know that hey, this this you know digging a hole is a profitable thing. You know, I can't make any money growing corn anymore. Can't right. make any money growing anything in agriculture in the state. But then he and, shouldn't have sold it. Well, but if it's, it's like not, if it's not, speci if it's, and if it's not specified, and gotta, if it's not specified, then he sell it. You would have to look at the non-contiguous development document. I don't remember right off the top of my head. Right. I really don't. The, the trans I read a lot. The transfer document specifically referenced the code sections. Okay. So it's not a part of the contract. Yeah, but she just but said she just deal. said that that the, the state will decertify you. If, I, I think you said well, I don't was know the word. She knows if you will, did, if you're digging at. holes on your farm, but I, yet we have we have the the county that's going contrary to that state requirement, saying you can dig holes on your farm. So which what are we back to this previous text amendment argument? Which one which one takes precedent? The Maryland Department of Planning argued their point was about saying whether it was permanent or not that and their their big question was what if you upzone does that change the upzoning does that change the acreage which you say is preserved because if you had to have eight acres of preserved lands for every acre that you develop if you upzone one to two does that change that non-contiguous development that, or the deed restricted open space that's already in place? Do you revert that back to the new upzoning? Or is it permanent once it's recorded in the land records and it's agreement with Queen Anne's County saying you are the holder of that conservation easement on that property, is it not subject to change? You know, and the but use again, is I, I, the uses part is what is the problem yeah. because when you go from an agricultural use to a commercial use it changes the intent of what that original contract or removal of development rights well you allow commercial uses here according to the document that i guess you did well, i don't know who you did nursery yeah. i mean i can pull yeah, it you out just you here say right here you've got uh, commercial sure forestry that, yeah. you've got uh, public recreation you know, are these not commercial uses? I don't know that commercial forestry is, I'd have to look up the definition, but I think that's just looking at a large scale timber forestry production. timber operation. How do, what, it's not a sawmill? Well, timber production is an agricultural use. Right. I didn't say that What? I'm saying that there's commercial activities that I think are allowed under this, mm -hmm. this, this ordinance. And that would be, once again, you would have to go back and look in the code and look mm -hmm. at what the def definition is of that particular use. I don't mean to be argumentative here. No, but, I understand. Uh, um, I can argue with you all day, Bill. You I know can, that. I know that. We can do this all day long. <laughs> I would say, as far as the state's concerned, if they say it's a commercial use, what's the end use? Where, where are we ending up? It's a commercial use during the actual excavation, but I've already shown you how it qualifies at the end of the day. So, I mean, I don't know how strong the state would be on that issue. These are 30-year commercial enterprises. Depends, these on how, depends on how big they are. I mean, that's the other thing about uh, you, could, you could pull as, as few as 40 acres for it on the non-contiguous, which is the five units that Donna referred mm -hmm. to. Eight units. It's, it's eight acres per unit, five units, 40 acres was the minimum. Of course, and some of them are more. But you'll have on many of them, you'll have a part of a farm, a 40 acre piece that's been set aside as a non-contiguous and you have an existing, say, excavation, you have a mining operation you know, that's occurring so there. Would you, it make more sense to continue that mining operation, even though it might go into the non-contiguous, than for the company to uproot and then move to another location? And if, you're, the whole if you're talking about size of the operation in the Ag District, it requires a minimum of 75 acres. 
Minimum. Yes. So that kind of gives you an idea of the size of the operation that it possibly could be. Okay. Did we muddy these orders enough? I think you've kicked it around enough. <laughs> okay, let me call for public. Uh, yes, Thank sir. Thank you. No, uh, you're not done. Da -da -da -da. Oh, okay. Thank you, Donna. Um, let's have Thank public you, comment. Mr. Falstead. Good morning, commissioners. Um, Jay Falstead, Queen Anne's Conservation Association. I think Mrs. Smith just um, really raised or rung the alarm bells. This would have unintended consequences that I think would be very difficult to contain. And so QACA urges an unfavorable recommendation on 2205. If this text amendment moves forward, it will really open Pandora's box and take, potentially take away hundreds, if not thousands, of acres of farmland by converting it to uh, useful agricultural land now into non-farm uses. Um, Mr. Drummond explained earlier, when you deal with these text amendments, you can't isolate it to just one proposal. You have to open it up to the countywide. This particular applicant was paid for these development rights uh, through NCD. They've sold them. And by doing this, you're potentially allowing all those farm landowners to get another bite at the apple. And again, that would open up Pandora's box. And so at what point does that end? This uh, text amendment is also inconsistent with the recently adopted 22, uh, 2022 comprehensive plan and for those reasons, we urge an unfavorable recommendation. Thank you. Any other public comment? There being none, let's go, go for the recommendation or non-recommendation or? Madam Chair, I make the motion that uh, this board, uh, with respect to Citizen Protect Amendment 2205, major extraction on a non-contiguous parcel, send an unfavorable recommendation. Uh, to the county commissioners. Is second. there a second? Second. Okay. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay. One nay. Thank you. Welcome. Which brings us to Taco 2207, Jamal Skent Narrows. I know the only person who doesn't believe that is Sharon. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times she's told me on my way up to the microphone to. Well, wait a minute. Okay, Stephanie's going to give her. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, so the proposed amendment in front of you is to allow for a bonus uh, of the maximum mixed-use residential density of up to 25 uh, units per acre. Um, and this has to be a dilapidated or abandoned structure, um, and they have to meet all the existing bonus density standards that are outlined within the, the WBC district. Um, it also uh, indicates that we should, there should be an added term to the purpose statement is to add mixed-use residential. Um, that's included in that proposal. So for a bonus within the waterfront village center to be granted, the, the developer must provide a monetary or an amenity uh, contribution basically to, for the public. Um, this is basically the monetary is, is dependent on what's in the code. So for whatever they're asking for, the additional, so you have what's permitted, then they're asking for the, the maximum of 25. So whatever that um, increases from what's permitted to what they're asking for is what they have to provide that monetary um, contribution for or the amenity. Um, and that's a the decision made by the Planning Commission. Um, I'm not sure how many have actually come before you, but that is uh, one of your decisions to make. Um, the existing permitted density in the WVC is 10 units per acre, and they're asking for 25, so there's the, right. the difference. Um, that would be the highest in the county, looking at all other residential, or all other uh, density requirements in the county, that would be the highest. Um, the dilapidated and abandoned structures, uh, there is not a definition in the code or the comprehensive plan that outlines what exactly the meaning of that would be. But we did put a couple definitions in your report just in case you want to look at those, get an idea. 
Um, also, with the higher density, obviously, you're going to have uh, a higher need for sewer, water, law enforcement, emergency services. Um, the comp plan and the Kent Narrows plan talked a lot about infill, infill redevelopment, revitalization. Um, so kind of think about those things that we, we looked at with the comp plan, um, trying to incorporate that into, obviously, this proposal itself. Um, the use of, <coughs> I guess, incentivizing that, um, it might be looked at as being contradictory only because you're incentivizing someone to basically allow their property to be abandoned or dilapidated. Right, so Mr. that's- Mr. Stevens, to address that, to that very topic, what happens when the property owner allows properties to deteriorate for the purpose of getting the bonus? Yeah, I'll do that in due course. Okay. All right, Which, that's fine. Question we um, might uh, apply to the property in question. Uh, let's see, where were we? Uh, I think that was, that was most of my comments there. Um, if the Planning Commission is inclined to give a favorable recommendation, um, there is a list of things you might want to discuss or um, contemplate that's in your staff report. Okay, Mr. Stevens, I believe you're on. Thank you very much, Joe Stevens, on behalf of Douglas Development. Paul Milstein here to my right, who you've met before, or at least those members of the commission have been here for a while. He's been before you several times. He's a principal with Douglas as well as Drew Turner on my left here. Um, I, I need to put a couple things into context. With Sorry, I, can, you, can you repeat the name names? Paul Milstein with Douglas Development. Principal. And Drew Turner also with Douglas Development. Okay. You don't have to press anything. It goes right through. Great. So it, it, and I'll get to Mr. Drummond's question in just a couple of minutes, and I'll let the general, these gentlemen talk about it, too. But it, the, the amendment that we're requesting, a couple of things in context. This project and this property has been before this commission and got two approvals in the past for concept plan, APF, and uh, amendment to master water and sewer plan from the county commissioners with um, a great deal of retail and commercial space, office space, and then above it a number, a large number of apartments. Um, the last one was in 2017 <coughs> where it received uh, concept plan approval and is allowed under the ordinance to put over 350 apartments above first floor retail. This amendment, if approved, um, would not allow that much density as part of a, as part of a mixed use. You would, you'd be allowed 25 units per acre as a, as a bonus, um, and uh, that would yield on this largest property in the Kent Narrows, which it is the largest property in the Kent Narrows, that would yield some 325 units. So it's really about a design flexibility because Douglas has been through this planning process a number of times um, and hasn't been able to get a project that they can do, that they can sell. And I'm, that's why these gentlemen are here to talk about that. So we're asking for some flexibility in design so they can do residential on, from the ground up and commercial separately in accordance with whatever county standards would be applicable. That's one. And two is the density provisions, which means it's your discretion. If you approve this amendment, we can't come in with a project and say, here it is. You all have to determine whether or not you want to allow that discretionary bonus density to be applied to it. So we'd have to come in, and I think um, Ms. Dobson, you probably remember, and, and, and Mr. Reese, because you were on the Planning Commission, maybe even Mr. Sylvester during a previous term, but they've come in and they've literally spent millions of dollars on design of projects to bring before you, and that's why they got these approvals. I mean, and we I'm keep giving them approval, and then they don't do anything. That's why I'll let these guys talk. I'm going to let these guys go into that. So, uh, so that's where we are in that regard. In regards to the dilapidated building provisions, we, we put that in there as some criteria for when you would apply the density bonus. We felt that there had to be some criteria, that it was a property in need of some attention. Um, but we don't think that it creates an incentive to put something dilapidated because you, there's no guarantee you'll get a bonus. So who's going to let their property go and not, you know, and not do the best they can to keep moving it forward when there's a real something they can do with it realistically on the hope that the, the planning commission might give it this bonus? That's one. Two is, is that 
if they build retail on the first floor, they can put one and a half times the number of units that this bonus would allow. So that's what this is about. It's not about, you know, it's not about more density. It's not about, you know, encouraging somebody to let their property go. Um, it's about establishing some criteria. So I'm going to turn it over to Paul first. So, so sure, and thank you, thank you, Commissioner. So the reality is, and, and as Ms. Dobson so eloquently put out there, we just don't, can, we don't do anything. We, we, we have had great support from the county, even Queen Anne's Conservation. Our previous iterations were far more dense far more heavy, you know, just much larger projects. The reality was the project we bought before you last time required a collaborative effort. That was a TIF that had to be underwritten by the county, the state, bonds. It required other projects within the county to move forward because the revenues weren't sufficient for our project alone. So it grouped other projects, and the reality is those projects didn't go forward. So what it, what it was dependent on so many outside factors. It was very aggressive. It was spectacular. And we put a lot into it. And you liked it and you approved it, and I appreciate it. But without so many other outside factors happening, it wasn't doable. They didn't happen. That wasn't our fault. We still stand here before we're ready to move forward. But being in, in a re looking realistically at where we stand today, we have, we have taken this provision and said, if we can work through this with the county, we can bring a project forward with your you know, working collaborative. We have a lot of things to submit that we could actually develop on our own. It needs no TIFs. It needs no $5 million infrastructure investment on the county's part on water and sewer. We can handle this on our own, and we can actually get something done. It's less dense. It's less spectacular, but it's a great development and a great piece of land that should be developed. Uh, we have been in a development mode since prior to 2010. We got a new approval in 2017. So why not renovate what's there? It's because we thought we'd be developing this thing for the last 17 years, right? So. So, you know, nobody's incentivized to let a property just elaborate. That's not a business plan. We don't buy land just to sit on it and let it be a blight to the community. That's an embarrassment. The comment that you just made, I've heard several times. I have many friends and family members that live in the area. I hear it. It's not what we do. In fact, since our approvals in Queen Anne's County, we've done hundreds of millions of dollars of developments that are now open, paying taxes, providing jobs and affordable housing. We're not the problem. Okay, so, and even with this density, it's, it's 350 units on 13 or so acres, of which this site was twice as large originally, half of it was deeded back to Queen Anne's Conservation as a buffer area. So, give or take, so the point is, this is something we can do with your help. It doesn't give us approval, it just gives us a path to continue to work collaboratively to bring you a development that we can actually build. We're just looking for a path, because we would like to get something done. And that's where we are. Yeah, and at the end of the day, the, the, because it's the bonus provision, it still has to have all of the amenities, access to the, you know, for, for public access, public amenities, which they had in their two original plans that they put before you. Um, and, um, uh, and, uh, and it's subject to whether or not you agree to allow, allow us to apply the, the bonus, which you've done sparingly on only a few projects in the Kent Narrows. And Douglas is willing to put themselves in that position. They're not asking for a straight out buy right because the county, they've worked with the county before. Staff has been great to work with. Um, and the projects that you have seen have been really very good. They just haven't been doable when you finally go out to finance. Um, and I, you didn't mention the parking structure issue that you had with the last one or, you know, the retail component, which has gone completely right. south. Right. So. so some factors change, but that's something we can And we know without the bonus provision, the reality is we're, we're stuck. And that, that just doesn't help us or the county, we believe, in any way. We are stuck, and we're very straightforward. And because this is uh, mentioned only in connection with site plan, that means it's 350 apartments. Well, I, I, I'll let you guys speak to that, what you're thinking about doing. It, it, what he, what he means is question. It, it's a multifamily, right? It would be a site plan. It's, yes, it wouldn't be, there wouldn't be any lots, if that's what you're asking. Yeah, wouldn't, wouldn't be, be any single, what? Single family lots. No, there wouldn't be. It, it, it would be either apartments or well, apartments. Or senior housing. It's apartments with a commercial, with, we have a, a, the, um, the property across the street where we have a, a boat yard there and a building and some, so, so that would be commercial. And the rest would be residential apartments, multifamily, either senior housing or something. And, and the important point I want to make is, is that while that's his, the vision right now for these guys, if staff and you all say, well, we're not really comfortable with that mix, we think it should be a little bit over this way, we should have a little more commercial, or that's your discretion. 
we're not, we don't establish that we automatically can do that because of this amendment. We just, it just allows us to come in and ask, ask if we can. Well, if the, if it's economically, if it's not feasible economically, except at 25 acres, why did you throw in this dilapidated uh, structure? To be, to coincide with some of the comp plan language about, um, about, um, uh, uh, properties that, that uh, they're looking to upgrade. What was the, I don't remember the language in, exactly. Infill. Infill in and, and some other things. If the, there are two things that if the, this commission wants to strike, we certainly don't have any issue with it. One is our use of residential in the very purpose statement. It wasn't intended to open up any books, any doors that the amendment itself wasn't intended to do so. And I think staff may be recommending <coughs> striking that if you're intending to support this amendment. That's fine with us. We don't have any issue with that. And if the, the, and if the Planning Commission has concern with the dilapidated structure language because of the potential of encouraging that, uh, we don't have any issue with that either. The goal for us is to create a mechanism that these guys can present a plan to you that has residential without having to have commercial below it and then have some commercial associated with it and, um, and let you all decide with staff input about what the right mix is. You may, re you may recall what was it six or eight months ago Mr. Petrie uh, made a similar proposal for the uh, for a structure at the uh, Bay Bridge uh, Marina. This is essentially the same thing. Hmm. That was a no. And it would provide 25 units per acre well, the of one piece of property in the county when all other apartment or multi-family density maximum is 20 per acre with a bonus. Well, the, the difference of the Petrie Amendment, which I was here for, and the Planning Commission supported, was that was in the urban commercial district where um, multifamily was not a permitted use. It, uh, excuse me, mixed use was not permitted. You could only do it above apartments. It's already permitted here. What we're asking for is the density provision. That's is a bonus. That's, that's a distinction. Something that came up in the other conversation that Council just references is sewer capacity. Can you speak to where you're going to find I can, that? Because this is this this is in the one of the issues in growth area projects that I've been. I've got my own soapbox, so I'll get on it for just a minute. Is this that Douglas has a plan had a plan approved for over 350 apartments that's going to use just as much sewer or more? Did he pay for it? Well, he, he, he did. did. He pay for no, sewer? he didn't. I, I'm not suggesting that he has sewer. That's not, not where I'm trying to go with that. And what I'm trying to say is, is that, is, is that whether he does commercial apartments above retail or you allow this amendment so they can propose to you to do more without, to do more without the retail on the first floor, the sewer demand is the same. But Joe, so that's you know the, that's the rules right now. Uh, and he's going to have to deal with that through the county commissioners if they're so inclined. Because this is a growth area, because this is smack in the, in the middle of the Kent Narrows, if the plan ends up getting re-rated, <coughs> Douglas will get in line and try to get sewer. And for a project that you all find acceptable. He won't get there unless that happens. Why and he treat, let me finish. Why should let we me, treat this differently than Barnstable? Well, first of all, because... You're listening very carefully to what you're pitching. <laughs> oh, I'm pitching that, that you, can al you can already do the same sewer demand here if you do it in commercial apartments. That's the irony of this whole thing. And that is, is not inconsistent with what Douglas would end up proposing before you. Okay? If the issue is the amount of sewer that your county has, and, and Douglas can come in and build a bunch of apartments on the second floor, third floor and fourth floor, it's drawing just as much sewer, the county commissioners can make a decision as to whether or not they want to allocate any of what remains to this. And I'm not here to speak, you know, about any other project, but there's a distinction between that and taking raw land that the county now has said that, that they have not just one piece or, or a number of pieces and saying we don't have enough sewer to service that right now, so we're going to put it on the back burner for a while. Those are two different things. I wanted to make an unsolicited comment. I was just going to come to you. <laughs> uh, and I agree with Joe on that point. And so what we are looking at is, um, and I'm going to speak very frankly, when we were going through the um, visioning sessions at the initial stages of updating the comp plan, 
This, the Jamal property was probably mentioned in every session in terms of um, citizen inquiry and complaint about the uh, vacant nature of the site. The Kent Narrows Development Foundation has been concerned about this vacant site. Um, so a part of the many challenges that we all had to face in looking at this update specific to our sewer allocation was one thing, but another layer of that was to streamline our zoning and make sure that where we do have development opportunities, where we are encouraging infill, where we are encouraging redevelopment, and Joe is correct, this is a site that is a redevelopment site. It's not vacant land. and the very nature of this site has been criticized and that is why that language was included in the land use section in one of our recommendations was to find a way to incentivize abandoned and dilapidated structures. I know that looks like we're favoring a site that has been fought, that has fallen into disrepair, but we were also asked by the community to address it. And so this was a way for us to address what the community has considered a blighted site and a site where we're losing um, economic development potential and value. And so um, this applicant has been waiting to put forward an amendment like this um, as they've been following our comprehensive um, plan update. So we are grappling with a lot of complicated issues trying to continue to help the community um, realize its f full potential in this area. So, yeah, it's not the easiest um, pill to swallow when you're looking at uh, the perception of incentivizing a site that is abandoned. But at the same time, this is a key, this has been a key issue, and the reasons that it has fallen into the state that it has that has been criticized by the community is pretty well explained and even though it might look like neglect from the outside it isn't necessarily the case yeah they're always demolishing structures well i mean with critical areas and where we are with all that would be very apprehensive to do anything on the site until we come in for an approval well, and then that would, provision wouldn't apply. So this text amendment would not be applicable. If this text amendment should go forward, this provision would not be applicable to a site where there weren't structures on it. I'm struggling with the concept of rewarding someone for letting property go to look as bad as it does after owning it for 20-some years. I, I, you know, I, that, that's, I, that's harsh because this group has come in and literally spent millions of dollars to try and develop it. I, I, don't, I don't take it personally. I think he's saying reward, that this is a general provision across the board. Um, if, if he means it's specific to us, then it's harsh and okay, we get <laughs> criticized. I know better. Uh, we, will, we, will have, we will never persevere on this site financially in our best wildest dreams. This, we didn't buy it 27 years ago to sit on it for 27 years. It's tough to develop here. It's real tough. So Paul's only owned that for 27 years. How many years? I think it's only. I think it's been since 1990 something. I don't remember the exact time frame. So. Whenever the outlets went defunct, it went to foreclosure. Jamal came in and bought it. I'm gonna go. Oh, okay. I'm gonna go like 2002, actually, probably. It's a long time. It's a long time. And and the reality is, we want to develop it, and that's why we're here. And we're trying to find a path to move forward. We've worked with Amy and her staff. We worked with Mike Winooski prior. After the other plan was not doable, we talked about what might make a path so we could actually develop this site. It was the comprehensive plan. It was a long community effort. It was many hearings. It was years of effort. And you know what? We stood beside. We participated. We've been patient. We pay every month. We pay our taxes, and we continue to do our thing. We're good partners. We're good neighbors. I think we're good stewards. We're charitable. We've made many donations to the community on that site, but we'd like to develop it. It's real simple, though. If we can't work this out, then we won't be able to develop it. There's no magic fairy here. This, this is just reality. I'm a straight shooting guy. If we can work forward, we can keep coming to a, a compromise and get something done. And if not, we'll, you know, then, then we can't. And we'll go on. And, and That's it. Right. But I think the, the important point is, is that this just gives us the ability to bring something to you that, that Douglas thinks will, will work. 
it doesn't require you to approve it. We're not asking for a straight, here's the site plan, we meet the setbacks, we meet the density, now, you don't like the design, well, we tweak a few things. It, it's at your discretion, and they're comfortable doing that because of their working relationship with you over the past 20 years. So that's, that's what we ask you to do. We don't need to, you know, if you have questions, we're here to answer it, but we know it's been a long day for you, so we're not going to sit here and just keep talking for the sake of talking. So my concern is you're coming here today asking for an increased density. You don't have any approval for increased sewer capacity. You don't have a plan for it. So why would we want to give a, an increased density when there's no plans put in place and you don't even know if the commissioners are going to do it? It's like we're putting the cart before the horse. So I, it's a great and question. I'm also concerned about, about this affecting the whole county. Just, the it, it, just Because just if, if you go through and you say, well, we can't do it with the current density, but we're going to do it under a commercial use and try and, and get it through, then you eat up whatever sewer capacities may be left. So, so two points. One, it's specific to just the Narrows. And quite frankly, I would be perfectly comfortable with specific just to our property. I'm not trying to save the world. I'm trying to get something developed that we've struggled very Petri's hard for. Is it property in a waterfront right. development? No. Is it? This is WBC we're talking about. Just WBC. Yeah, but it's not the Narrows, is it? Is that just the only the one? I thought, I thought his, his was waterfront. I think this only applies to the waterfront, uh, the Kent Narrows. Waterfront village. Yes, you're correct. Okay. And, and to Mr. Reese's point, and I, and I like the point, we've worked this backwards. We, we took the density that was allowed under the current bonus provisions, we've done the math, we've done everything, and it didn't work. That's why we're asking for the extra, because we know it doesn't work. And I don't want to spend another three or four years showing you beautiful pictures of a great development that I then can't go build. So we worked backwards on this. We have done a lot of road work with the commissioners, and we believe that the commissioners will be favorable in time on this development. This is a, a, a very important project for many of the people to get developed. But if we can't get the extra five per acre, then there's no point in us even going any further. We just stop. Because we know it doesn't work, so why would we waste any more of your time or anybody else's? But we do believe we could get it approved. So, we so then you incentivize us to start a vacant and bladed property tax so that you pay a higher tax for leaving such an eyesore in our county. So, so we, we, you know, Come you on, may Mr. see it that Westing. way. That, that's not what our intention here, and, and that's never been our intention. We're not trying to incentivize you to do anything other than see this project move forward once and for all. Listen to your constituents. Listen to your community. I don't live here. We can get this done with a tweak to the bonus provision of which we pay for. We're not asking for a free ride. We're going to end up paying for the sewer and water that we asked the county to pay for last time. We're going to pay for that now. We're, we were going to get millions of dollars in a TIF to subsidize. That's all going away. This has gotten financially way worse for us, but we're willing to push forward with a little bit of room from the county. It's the county's decision. We're not trying to set anything up for the future. Just success. And I just want to add that procedurally, Mr. Reese, that um, we couldn't put a plan forward. We wouldn't be allowed to under the code provisions and go to the commissioners for sewer or anything like that unless, not with the densities that we're talking about, unless the code amendment provides us a, a path to do it. So we have, this is really the first step. We have to do this. Could, could you give us an, a bit of an explanation as to why uh, other uh, property owners have been able to economically develop apartment complexes at 20 per acre, but this can't, be, but it can't be done on this property? Well, is that question to me or to Joe? Well, well I, have, I have no idea the other properties, economics, the land values, the water and sewer costs to develop, the stormwater management. There's no stormwater management on this site. We're starting from scratch. So our, our development costs are, are very high here. I don't, I don't know the particulars of other development. I'll be glad to share underwriting if that's something you'd like to see in the future because the numbers are what the numbers are. But I, I don't know the particulars of their development. Well, I just know we've looked at this. We will have to share that with you under the bonus provisions. Right. In order to get the bonus, we have to, we have to pay to the Kent Narrows uh, a percentage of the, val of the construction value of, of what you give us a bonus for. That's what the code sets out. So we have to disclose all that to you. I would also add the other thing is, you know, building a, a, a commercial apartment, commercial on the first floor with some apartments above it and raw land, is a lot on a piece of property, perhaps in the TC zone or something of that nature, is different than here. One major reason is because the county exacts a great deal of public amenities. If you remember the other two plans that came before you, there were amphitheaters, there were parks. 
Um, there was parking there, garages. There were parking garages. I mean, there were a lot of public amenities which the county expects in the Kent Narrows. So it's a it's a different animal. <coughs> so that means all that goes away. No, no, we got to come back to the planning commission. Still, to do, you still planning on a You will see garage? those. Yes, you'll. Oh, I don't know. I, I can't no. speak to the specifics. I don't think so. But no, no, not a parking garage. No. That will go the Cross on. Island Trail improvements, a lot of the other site improvements, the parking, that, that, that was one of the main killers, the, the structured parking, which required the TIF, which had the TIF going through, we would have done it. But it, that's not us. That was other developments as well. We would have done it. So, um, go ahead. Public. Go I'd like it quiet. So I'm, I'm kind of new here, and the um, uh, question I have is with regards to the sewer application. Yes. And I read the paper occasionally. And, um, you know, we're, we're in a way, so to speak, in this county with regards to our sewer allocation. I assume there is some available sewer. Mm -hmm. With what you guys are proposing, how much are you going to take and how much is it going to leave for the rest of the people in the county? We actually, so this proposed direction would actually be 20% less than what was originally approved in, in our prior iteration. So it's a reduction in sewer capacity. We had all the calculations, and there is allocations available. And the reality is it's going to come down to the county to decide what projects they want to move forward and, and what pro you know, they're going to prioritize the projects. We have nothing guaranteed, but have pretty good feedback that there is a really strong desire to move this project forward. Um, we have, again, no guarantees, but again, to get to that answer and to apply, we need a path to simply continue the dialogue in a meaningful way. They may say no, and we may be in the same spot. But our, our, what we're hearing is that the, the, we have a very good opportunity to get the allocations to build this site. The, the only thing I'll add is that around 20% of the allocations that we need already exist on site with the existing structures that are there, going back to the comp plans. But it still didn't answer the question how much is going to be left for everybody else. Our understanding, the numbers constantly moving as far as exactly how much is there. We know how much we need for this development. The previous one that Paul mentioned, the one that was approved by the Planning Commission needed around 60,000. This one needs around 50,000 gallons. We have 8,000 already accounted for on site. Um, so you're talking around 48 to 47,000 okay. gallons is what we need. 42. And if that doesn't leave, I, yeah, I, I'm sorry, my 42. Math, my math 42. 42. 42, you're right. Okay, so we only have 55, correct? That's the number that we've seen mm. consistent. That's a huge, huge chunk. And the commissioners will have to decide whether or not they want to allocate that. And, and there's also been discussion of the re-rating, which hasn't started yet, of the plant. So that might free up some addition, as you know, from the presentation that you've had. That could free up additional capacity allocation. But the point that I keep trying to make is, it, from an allocation standpoint, we're not in any different position if you adopt this amendment than what we're in right now. If they could make a commercial apartment project work, if, the, if they could build the retail, all the retail that the code calls for, and then apartments above it, they could submit that plan today and go and then ask for sewer at the same levels of what is, as what this amendment would permit them to do. That's, that's the point. That was, that was my soapbox. All right. I, so I agree with the, uh, the proposition that this text amendment should not rise, on, rise or fall on whether or not there's adequate sewer for whatever they may propose that this is a zoning issue a planning issue which brings uh, me not to a, not an infrastructure issue you got to decide whether 25 units per acre yeah uh, for properties that have dil uh, dilapidated structures is good public policy in the okay. waterfront village district which brings me to my question since since you claim that this is strictly the jamal property i can't think of another one Offhand. Well, that's not the point. What about the future? I agree. You, go, you can't think about one piece of property. Is, is this for the WBC districts in the county? Everything or just for this? There's only one WBC only district. One. There's only one? Okay. Ken Harris. I mean, we almost ended up with the same situation down at the, where the cult classic is now with that whole shopping center area. But it, that's not in the WBC. They just kept... Right. But should it be? No. If, it, if we're going to keep this in the WVC, it... It's possible. I could think about the uh, property on the, uh, uh, gosh, uh, on the east side, right by the bridge across from the uh, landing. United Who owns that? United Do they 
on that now? No, Roy, yes, they United did. Shellfish. Right, they did. United does on that. I did the closing. So that, that has a dilapidated structure on it. Been dilapidated for 40 years. <laughs> but, I mean, if if that language concerns you, then we're not, you know, we're not wedded to that. I language. don't want to open it up to the rest of the county. We're no, no, to, I'm just saying the tent to... narrows itself. If you want anybody, you know, that wants to come in and, and make the application to you. Again, I keep going back to this. You don't have to approve a density bonus. You've got to be really comfortable that you're getting what you want from the goals of the plan, the goals of the Kent Narrows plan, and what, you know, and what you're getting for amenities to be comfortable with approving that bonus. I'm, I'm sorry. I, what is it about the WBC? I have to, to work on this again. That makes it impossible to have an economically viable residential development at 20 acres, 20 acres, 20 units per acre, when that apparently is satisfactory in all the other uh, high density residential districts. It's not 20 units per acre in the or, w, or the TC district. It's not 20 units per acre in the, in the WBC. It's 10 units per acre, but you could apply for that same. Um, what's the provision that, that the county has on fi just five acres on a minimum of five acre maximum of five acres? You could apply for 20 units per acre if it was workforce housing or senior housing. So that same provision does apply in the WVC, but it's not across. It would only apply to five acres. Okay, and you let's, say, let's take the five acres away then and say you could get up to 20 in the WVC on a track Both greater end? than five acres. I, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to understand why, not, I'm I'm not, I hope perhaps the Planning Commission is trying to understand why 20 acres is economically viable elsewhere, but not in the WVC. So, I, and you also yes, said that earlier that, that the deal breaker was the concrete. Um, there, 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 well, it was the parking. There the were parking. many deal breakers. I mean, it was concrete parking. It was all the site developments, and it was the TIF not going forward. I mean, that was a, a deal breaker. It was the off-site expenses. It was many, many factors to bring that plan forward. That took a very large collaborative effort. It, it's, for developing this site, every site is different for the most part. Right. This and, and the soil conditions on this site, the storm management, the road access. All I can do is I can show you our I'm, I'm open book. We have to show it to you anyway. You could see the performance. You could see the construction budgets. We don't make these numbers up, um, and it didn't work. I, I don't. I don't. You know. So I just um, we'll show it to you. you. If you're a numbers guy, you'll look at it and you'll, you'll you'll be able to see and you decide if you agree or not. We're not asking you to approve anything other than the opportunity to keep coming forward. To, to, to submit something that you could approve or disapprove. We're asking, it gives us a path forward to continue to communicate and work on this project. That's what we're asking for. To me, in a simple way, I'm a simple guy. I don't know all the technical language, but that's what we're looking for. All right, let's ask for public comment. Mm, there's been one. Oh, you have one? It's from Shore Rivers comments on citizen-sponsored text amendment application TACO number 22-07. Thank you for your opportunity to submit comments on the citizen-sponsored text amendment application TACO number 22-07. Shore Rivers is a local nonprofit dedicated to the protection and restoration of eastern shore waterways, including Queen Anne's County, Chester and Wye River, and Eastern Bay, and its tributaries through science-based advocacy, restoration, and education. Taco number 22-07 would increase a maximum mixed-use residential density per acre from 10 to 25 dwellings within the waterfront village center. Considering the existing sewage sewerage capacity issues, Shore Rivers does not support this citizen-sponsored text amendment application. The county's Kent Narrow, Stevensville, Graysonville wastewater treatment plan is now nearly fully obligated by estimated existing and future capacity commitments. It has been concluded that there is an insignificant amount of capacity available at this plant. Increasing the maximum mixed use residential density allowed in an area would, without in, an adequate sewerage capacity is irresponsible planning and would not support the recently drafted 2021 comprehensive plan which recommends that sewerage treatment capacity at the KNSG plant needs to be rationed and strategically managed. Given the wastewater capacity issues the county currently faces, Shore Rivers urges the commission to give an unfavorable report on TACO number 22-07. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide comment. So, Mr. Milstein, you, you made a comment that you couldn't build because of the TIF. 
but we had other large significant projects continue down in the Narrows without the TIF moving forward. Why was that such a big um, The TIF impact? provided about $12 million of available dollars for both on-site and off-site. And when the TIF went away, Meters Marina was one that was very important to the TIF. That didn't move forward. So without the, the, the TIF couldn't, what's that? That was a big one, I was saying. I was just agreeing that was, with that. So that, without that, the TIF didn't underwrite, and that's a bonding thing, and that's not me. I had nothing to do with it, and it just couldn't go for it. So it, it blew up on us, quite frankly. Again, as to other developments that move forward, I don't know the, 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 the land cost, the development cost, the underwriting, the rents. I, I can't speak to those. But this project clearly needed a TIF. Uh, the Kenton Arrows Development Foundation was supportive of the TIF. The county was supportive of the TIF. We were all together on it, but it involved other, other developments moving forward that didn't happen. So, and that, in fact, should be a, a pretty decent indicator of the, you know, the challenges of the site. It's a challenged site. Okay, do we have any other questions? Anything, any comments? Okay, there being none. Do we want to make a recommendation? Is there pre-designed wording in here? Recommendation? Recommendation for or against, and then if you want to make recommendations to, to the changes of the language that they've proposed. Do you want to do it? Well, I, uh, part of our just general discussion amongst the commission, I don't like the language of vacant and dilapidated properties. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think that, that there's been adequate responses to why you can't develop with the current densities. Um, everyone else is doing it that has received approvals from this, this commission. Um, so at this point in time, I, I mean, I can make the motion. However, I'm going to make an unfavorable motion. Go ahead, let's see what happens. So, <laughs> here we go. Can I say something before you say that? Certainly. I've never been unsure about something like I'm unsure about this, quite frankly. You guys have had this thing for 20 some years. Yes, sir. You've let the buildings dilapidate, quite frankly. As he's made a point, other companies, other individuals, whoever they are, have come in and done quite significant projects down there mm -hmm. and elsewhere mm -hmm. and not asked for this. Mm -hmm. We're at we're at our close to our limit on sewer allocation, but I understand what you're saying. That should not be part of it. And it's available, it's available. But you guys don't strike me as being totally upfront with us. Okay. So uh, that's unfortunate, um, and, and, and you, you perceive my words as ever you perceive. I do the best I can. I know you do, uh, I, I'm, and I'm not saying no. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, I am unsure yeah. about this. Is, is, is Here, here's what I could say, and I've, and I've tried to be, and um, the reality is we can show you the economics. We're open book. I'm not a fancy financial person. I don't run numbers. I build buildings. I do developments. The reality is without the additional five, we're stuck. We've been stuck, and we're stuck. So we'll pack up our tents and very disappointedly move on. And that stinks. Well, you wouldn't be the first one lost money in this county. Yeah, no, and, and thank God you know, the development of this property doesn't depend on me feeding my family. Okay. Or I'd be a skinny yeah. dude right now. It, it, right. It's, so It's much more than the five, though. It's not just five units. I, that's a miscon that's misconception. We don't have a 20-unit per acre density down there right now. It's 10 units per acre. Okay. Under a different bonus provision the county has on just five acres, you can go to 20 units per acre if you make it workforce housing or senior housing. That, so the remain so it's not it's not 20 for the whole thing. I just wanted to make sure that that was. All right. That so was a, if we changed it so years? the five acre limitation We're, doesn't apply, it doesn't we apply. We're about 100. The, the next problem is is that I don't want to be pejorative. I'm trying to be neutral. Uh, wouldn't be able to take advantage of the bonus because the plan is not to build affordable housing is to build the waterfront luxury stuff. 
We will, I mean, there's gonna, it's going to build to what I assume what the market's going to have, but we will also have to have our components of MPDUs. Right. That does apply. I get that. It still does. You said or were you just, yeah, we yeah, but, in lieu no, of it. you'll pay for in lieu and not, and not do any of that. This is more, uh, our intent right now, what we've been planning on is the 10% empty, the that requirement is what we've The rest of the market. Um, That's and, right. And, and in regards to the open book, they're going to pay fee and so the, the open book contract, Mr. Sylvester. Because we're doing this as a bonus, mm -hmm. and because it's not going to, it's not a buy right density. We'll have to give you all that through the review process, and you'll have your opportunity to say, "Wait a second, you shouldn't get to this number." Or, "Okay, I'm comfortable with it because you're contributing X here and Y there." That's, you know, I, if I've made any point today, I hope it's that. This does not guarantee that they can get there, and you will have the next bite at this, and the book will be open. We just don't have the book yet because we don't know what we can do. So, thank you very much for the time. Okay, Mr. Reese. I can kind of see how you could get to, in this district, you could get to 20, 20 units per acre because that is what the county, that's the max the county is ever allowed <coughs> just i don't get that going up another five. Well, are you suggesting to change it to 20 units per acre in this district well to make it consistent say with the tc or something how you get the 20 how you get the 20 per acre if that doesn't exist now i, I don't know if it's worth I, anything I, I get it doesn't exist now i get that but going back to the plan that was approved before it was 28 units per acre is what we had approved, but the way we were getting there was through a different mechanism within the code, which was right. through the additional residential density that's allowed based off the commercial that you build. Yeah. That's what the rules are now. Yep. Well, well, understood, sense, understood. Whether and, they make sense and, or not is beside the point. Yeah. That's the rule. And, and, <laughs> and that project, going back to the TIF, the other thing is just market dynamics in terms of the commercial office market is completely different than it was in 2017. The retail market was already struggling then. You layer COVID on top, and it's extremely challenging to make commercial buildings work in today's environment. And so we were really trying to work backwards from, okay, what's the residential density we need to make this viable, back to what Paul was saying. Um, and 25 is, I know it's only five more than what it was, why can't you make it work at 20? But that's, you know, looking at our site, the area, how it lays out, that's how we arrived to that number. Um, and as far as sewer allocation goes, going back to the original plan, this is less than that. It's less units in terms of units per acre than it was before. So we were trying to keep it simple in that way as far as what was it before and we're less than it was before. So, you know, we're looking to, and once again, this is step one of a much lengthier planning process and review process. Have you guys taken into account any of the public facilities? As far as the sewer goes, specific no, sewer? Have, the general uh, adequate public facilities. They've for done adequate else. public facilities for both other plans that are both approved, APF, uh, APF studies approved. Under, by under previous projects. Under the previous projects, which were more density, more, more units. It just was a different type of unit, but yes. And so we, we will do that again if we get this amendment. We'll submit another APF. For the study. Right. Remember, you've got to divorce the proposal from the, pro from the property we're all talking about. It's 25 <laughs> acres. I keep saying that. 25 <laughs> units Lighting per acres. acre makes sense in the WBC. Based on the information above, it is my recommendation that the Planning Commission send an unfavorable recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners on the text amendment number 2207, bonus density for mixed use residential density in the Waterfront Village Center. It is my opinion. No, I'll leave it at that. Do we have a second? There be a none. I guess that recommendation didn't advance. Can I have another recommendation? I, you gonna do it, Art? <laughs> I I'll get Chris to write it out for me so I can. Because I looked at the bottom of the first page, proposed tax tax amendment. Yeah. I was going to just use that. I think there's something on ten page of, ten, of ten. ten of ten. Ten of ten. Mm -hmm. Ten of ten. Based on the information 
uh, above if the Planning Commission is inclined to a Senate favorable recommendation. That, that's that doesn't seem that's to work. That doesn't seem to work. Recommends a favorable recommendation. Uh, now, what sends a favorable recommendation? Um, based on the information above, the Planning Commission set, uh, is inclined to send a favorable recommendation to the Board of County Commissioners. Then it is suggested that, and it is suggested consideration and discussion ensure consistency with 18 uh, 1 221 and uh, section 4 204 uh, land use article. Uh, Still, still doesn't read right. I like your idea to first go to the first page. I think that's the way to do it. Pardon me? I didn't say anything. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Um, well, wait a minute. We got it. Okay. Are you making a motion there? I'm going to pull it back and let, okay. let Bill well, take a stab off. at it because I don't you. like the way this reads. Yeah, I don't. Okay. Um, I would make a motion that we send a favorable recommendation on uh, citizen sponsor text amendment number 22-07 uh, that would change the mixed unit develop, uh, density to 25 dwellings per acre. Second. In the WVC, in the WVC district. That's part of the density bonus. Okay. Yeah. Second. Are you guys proposing to remove the residential portion of the <coughs> the purpose statement also? What is she? Yes. Um, okay. Yes. <laughs> yes, dear. Which by removing that, that would mean it would have to be mixed use, correct? Yes. Yeah, so residential is included in the definition of mixed use. So there's really no need to put mixed use residential in the purpose statement. Yeah. So. And, and as I as I heard it, this, the mixed use will be residential on this side of the street and commercial on this side of the street. But they have to meet the mixed use standards. That has not been amended. So that would come back yeah. to you. And yeah. Yeah. Just That's right. get it to the next step. Okay, do we have a second? I did second it. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Okay, then I'm looking for my favorite. Public, public comment. Uh oh, public Madam comment. Madam Chair, right? you accept the motion to adjourn. Wait a minute, well, public comment. Public comments? No. no one? Now we go for the motion, my favorite motion. Madam Chair, will you accept the motion to adjourn? Absolutely. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're out of here. <laughs>